uh, the joint hearing of the subcommittee on early childhood, elementary and secondary education and the subcommittee on higher education and workforce investment will come to order. Welcome everyone. I note that a quorum is present. The subcommittees are meeting today to hear testimony examining the implementation of COVID-19 education funds. This is an entirely remote hearing. All microphones will be kept muted as a general rule to avoid unnecessary background noise. Members and witnesses will be responsible for unmuting themselves when they are recognized to speak or when they wish to seek recognition. I also ask that members please identify themselves before they speak. Members should keep their cameras on while in the proceeding. Members shall be considered present in the proceeding when they are visible on camera and they shall be considered not present when they are not visible on camera. The only exception to this if there are experiencing technical difficulty and inform the committee staff of such difficulty. If any member experiences technical difficulty during the hearing, you should stay connected on the platform, make sure you are muted and use your phone to immediately call the committee's IT director whose number was provided in advance. Should the chair experience technical difficulty or need to step away to vote in a markup in another committee, Mrs. Wilson as chair of the higher education and Workforce Investment Subcommittee, or another majority member is hereby authorized to assume the gavel in the chair's absence. This is an entirely remote hearing, and as such, the committee's hearing room is officially closed. Members who choose to sit with their individual devices in the hearing room must wear headphones to avoid feedback, echoes, and distortion resulting from more than one person on the software platform sitting in the same room. Members are also expected to adhere to social distancing and safe care guidelines, including the use of masks, hand sanitizer, and wiping down their areas both before and after their presence in the hearing room. In order to ensure that the committee's five minute rules adhere to, staff will be keeping track of the time using the committee's field timer. The field timer will appear on its own thumbnail picture and will be named 001 underscore timer. There will be no one minute remaining warning. The field timer will show a blinking light when time is up. Members and witnesses are asked to wrap up promptly when their time has expired. Pursuant to committee rule 8C, opening statements are limited to the subcommittee chairs and the ranking members. This allows us to hear from our witnesses sooner and provide all members with adequate time to ask questions. I recognize myself now for the purpose of making an opening statement. Today, we're meeting to take stock of our nation's K-12 schools and institutions of higher learning and higher education are using the Education Stabilization Fund, uh, including, including in the American Rescue Plan, uh, to weather the pandemic and keep students learning. We're joined today by Undersecretary Kowal and Deputy Secretary Martin. We look forward to their testimony regarding the Department of Education's plan to ensure states, school districts, and institutions of higher education are using the Education Stabilization Fund as Congress intended. Mr. Kowal and Ms. Martin, thank you very much for joining us. As we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic has had a severe impact on students of all ages. In response, Congress has provided an historic level of funding to help states and school districts reopen schools safely and get students back into the classroom. The American Rescue Plan funding was the single, single largest investment in K through 12 schooling that the federal government has ever made. But we also provided support for schools and school staff and students in the CARES Act, the Corona Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act totaling net nearly $200 billion in total for K through 12. This funding is a major reason why school districts around the country can reopen safely, stay open safely, and offer students additional resources to catch up where needed. The money is also helping with the mental and social stress the students and staff have suffered during the pandemic. A few examples. In Michigan, a school district used the education stabilization funds to upgrade ventilation systems to improve air quality and reduce the spread of COVID. In Virginia, a school district used the money to hire more tutors to help close the students' achievement gap. In North Carolina, a school district was able to bring in more mental health counselors. In Utah, a school district is using this federal assistance to pay for after-school programs to make up for lost time in the classroom. And in my own district, the Northern Mariana Islands, 
public school system is expanding career and technical learning through its career pathway programs so students in the Marianas are ready to enter a rebounding economy. I am sure that every member of our two subcommittees have their own examples of how emergency funding for schools that the Biden administration pushed for and Congress delivered is helping our constituents. However, because this has been lots of such a large investment of federal resources, our two subcommittees' responsibility to keep watch over spending is even more pronounced than normal. While there have been reported instances where districts use um, education stabilization funds for projects outside of the intended scope, this district seems to be the exception, not the rule. Moreover, as we will hear from our witnesses, the Department of Education has a clear path of oversight on the Education Stabilization Fund. The COVID-19 pandemic revealed long-standing challenges in our education system. It should be the norm the schools have functioning ventilation systems, not something we only think of in a pandemic. It should be the norm that students have access to tutors and counselors to meet their needs. I would like to believe that these emergency investments we have made will demonstrate that this is the scale of support we should be always providing our schools and prove what I believe that by investing in education, we are strengthening America's economy and preparing young, young people for lifelong success. I look forward to working with my colleagues to continue investing in America's future by investing in our students' futures. I now turn to the ranking member, Mr. Owens, for the purpose of making an opening statement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the Biden administration has been so wrapped up in trying to implement its radical agenda that the real problem facing K through 12 education is taking the back seat. If students were the left's true priority, the Biden administration would be offering solutions for the immense damage done by keeping kids out of the classroom for over a year instead of attempting to sick the DOJ on parents of school board meetings. But we're here to talk about oversight, an oversight of an extraordinary amount of money that's been thrown at schools. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, implementing this, the COVID-19 mitigation strategy would cost $25 billion at most. Yet, even after Republicans and Democrats in Congress allocated $70 billion in K-12 relief funds, Democrats insisted on spending another $120 billion of taxpayer funds on schools under the American Rescue Plan. Now, let me repeat that. $25 billion suggested. 70 billion allocated by and by bipartisan and 120 billion finally spent by the assistance of Democrats. The Democrats radical spending spree should not be seen as anything but a frenzied attempt to score political points with teachers unions. Since spending the money, Democrats have shown little interest in how these funds are being used or if they're being accomplished or they accomplish any of the attended purposes. Spending 400% more to K through 12 schools than it normally received from the Department of Education in one year should warrant transparency and accountability at the very least. We have a duty as taxpayers to, to our taxpayers to ensure their money is being used as efficiently and effectively as possible. However, I'm concerned the Democrats created no pathway for us to keep track on how the money they have assisted on spending is being spent. This will make it very difficult for Congress to fulfill its duties. But more importantly, the Democrats, the department would, should refocus on students. We should not let their needs or voices be lost. Students should continue to be the priority and not the adults overseeing the, 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 the labor unions. With that, I yield back. Thank you. Um, I now would like to recognize Ms. Wilson of Florida, the chair of the Higher Education and Workforce Investment Subcommittee for the purpose of making an open statement. Ms. Wilson, please. Thank you, uh, Chair Sablon. Work welcome to everyone. Thank you for hosting this hearing and providing an opportunity to discuss how higher education institutions have used the Education Stabilization Fund to reopen their campuses safely, address the urgent needs of students and cover the added operating costs during the pandemic. The economic fallout from COVID-19 has exacerbated the challenges our students and institutions face. Across the US, colleges and universities experience sharp declines in enrollment, severe funding cuts and revenue losses due 
to campus closures and were necessary to stop the spread of the virus. In response, Congress provided more than 75 billion in funding to institutions through three COVID-19 relief bills, including the American Rescue Plan Act. Importantly, institutions were required to use at least half of the funding they received to provide emergency financial aid grants personally to students. So for students across the nation, the American Rescue Plan funding has helped prevent homelessness and hunger in our, for our students. For institutions, the American Rescue Plan funding helped offset revenue losses and supported efforts to test for, track and mitigate the spread of COVID-19. In my district, Florida International University used these funds to respond to pandemic related challenges in real time, including to set up a COVID-19 testing lab, establish a prevention and response team to carry out contact tracing, conduct uh, outreach to their campus community on best practices, and meet technology needs of faculty and staff that were attending classes or working remotely. Children were given cash money to help them through this pandemic. Needy students, sometimes twice during the pandemic and it's ongoing. The investments we delivered to colleges and universities provided a lifeline to students and may have prevented the financial collapse of our higher education system. The education department must continue to ensure that institutions are using this funding responsibly to support their students, faculty and staff, and that states are holding up their end of the bargain by maintaining their investments in higher education. Quality higher education remains the surest pathway to the middle class for Americans across this nation. Congress and the education department must work together to help students and institutions fully recover from this pandemic and to continue expanding access to the life-changing benefits that come with a quality degree. I look forward to hearing Ms. Car Mr. Carwell and Ms. Martin's plans to continue strengthening oversight and ensuring that our investments provide students access to a safe, affordable, and quality education. I'm now pleased to yield to the distinguished ranking member of the Higher Education and Workforce Investments Subcommittee, Dr. Murphy, to make his opening statement. Dr. Murphy. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and uh, thank everyone for coming today. Congressional oversight of the federal government is one of this, com this uh, committee's most important duties. This includes, among other things, ensuring that taxpayer dollars are used effectively and for their intended purposes. There is no such thing as government funded programs. These are only taxpayer funded programs. And those hardworking taxpayers deserve to know how their money is being spent. Like other industries, the pandemic caught higher education flat foot. We did, never, we did not understand this was coming and there was not much of a response that we had before then. In response, Congress provided colleges and universities over $70 billion in relief funding on top of over the $100 billion in grants, loans, and other student aid appropriated by Congress each year. While this support was a lifeline to many institutions of higher education, many schools were previously already struggling prior to this once, uh, this once in a generation or hopefully more than that pandemic. COVID-19 only accelerated the need for those institutions to rethink their business models if they're to survive in the future and shed further light on the issues that have plagued our higher education system. Regardless, despite what some think, as major recipients of taxpayer dollars, institutions of higher education are not 
exempt from congressional oversight and accountability. As it stands, 40% of all students now fail to graduate from a college or university within six years. Let me read that again. 40% of students fail to graduate from a college or university within six years. For those students who do complete their degree, they often find themselves ill-prepared for the workforce and worse off financially than they would, have been, they would have been if they had not attended that college or university. Yet many of my colleagues suggest that the solution to double to, is to double down on the ill-conceived and misguided idea that more money always means better outcomes. When colleges spend exorbitant amounts of taxpayer dollars on administrative salaries and administrative bloat, instead of innovating funding ways to improve student outcomes, more money will result in much more of the same and poor student outcomes. It is Congress and this department's responsibility to ensure that colleges and universities spend taxpayer dollars in a way that helps students, not hire more administrators or grow more non-academic programs, which is why I'm happy that we are having this hearing today. Unfortunately, however, I share the concern of many of my colleagues that the department is too focused on implementing their progressive wish list and attacking colleges based upon their tax status to carry out their necessary oversight of the $280 billion in pandemic relief funds the department is responsible for. That said, I'm looking forward to hearing from Mr. Caval and Ms. Wharton, whom I hope will provide some clarity regarding the numerous tasks they are responsible for overseeing at the department. Lastly, I would just like to point out something and express a concern of mine regarding witness testimony. Our ability to provide sufficient oversight is hindered when witnesses don't have the courtesy to provide their testimony in, the, in, a, in, a, in a timely manner as what's happened here. My hope that this does not become a pattern and our witnesses today do a better job of respecting the uh, very busy schedule of this committee in the future. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I will now yield back. Um, without objection, all other members who wish to insert written statements into the record may do so by submitting them to the committee clerk electronically in Microsoft Word format by 5 p.m. on December 1st. I will now introduce, introduce our witnesses. Ms. Cindy Martin is currently Deputy Secretary at the Department of Education. Before joining the department, Ms. Martin served as the Superintendent of the San Diego Unified School District. She has spent 32 years as an educator, holding various roles of increasing responsibility as a teacher, leadership specialist, vice principal, and, and principal. Mr. James Kowal is currently undersecretary at the Department of Education. He's, he most recently served as the president of the Institute for College Access and Success, a research and advocacy nonprofit dedicated to affordability and equity in higher education. Mr. Kawa also served in the Obama administration as the Deputy Domestic Policy Advisor at the White House and Deputy Undersecretary at the Department. He also served as a staffer on the committee. We appreciate the witnesses for participating today and look forward to your testimony. Let me remind the witnesses that we have read your written statement and they will appear in full in the hearing record. Pursuant to Committee Rule 8D and Committee Practice, each of you is asked to limit your oral presentation to a five-minute summary of your written statement. Before you begin your testimony, please remember to unmute your microphone. And during your testimony, staff will be keeping track of time and a light will blink when time is up. Please be sensitive to the time wrap-up when your time is over and remute your microphone. If any of you experience technical difficulties during your testimony or later in the hearing, you should stay connected on the platform, make sure you are muted and use your phone to immediately call the committee's IT director whose number was provided to you in advance. We will let all witnesses make their presentation before we move to member questions. When answering a question, please remember to unmute your microphone. The witnesses are aware of the responsibility to provide accurate information to the committee and therefore we will proceed with their testimony. I will first recognize Ms. Martin. Ms. Martin, you have five minutes, please. Thank you very much. Good morning, Chair Sablon, Chair Wilson, Ranking Member Owen, Ranking Member Murphy, and Chair Scott, and Ranking Member Fox, and distinguished members of the subcommittees. I'm honored to be here alongside Undersecretary James Qual to speak about the important progress the Department 
of Education is making in supporting our schools and students as they recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. I thank this body for the important investments you have made through the Education Stabilization Fund to get our children safely back in school and to address the impact of the pandemic on students' social, emotional, mental health, and academic needs. The pandemic has both shined a light on and exacerbated the existing challenges in our education system. Since the beginning of the administration, President Biden and the department have had a clear objective, getting students back in school, in person, full time, and building back better to inspire our nation's educators to turn the pandemic's lessons into a more equitable experience for all students. We cannot go back to the status quo. We know that students learn and develop best socially, emotionally, and academically at school. And early in the administration, we built an infrastructure to support states and districts in tackling this goal. We continue to develop and refine resources, guidance, and support mechanisms to meet the needs of students, families, and educators around the country. These support systems are working. In January, only 46% of schools around the country were open for fully in-person instruction. Today, that number is 99.2%, representing 99.6% of all students. We know more about the COVID-19 virus than we did in early 2020. And we know more about the science that is effectively keeping our students safe in schools. Using layered mitigation strategies tailored to the needs of local communities, schools can now effectively plan for healthy in-person learning, ensuring minimal disruption and consistently safe in-person experiences for all students. The funding provided through the Education Stabilization Fund, including through the American Rescue Plan Act, is helping schools around the country implement these strategies and institutionalize evidence-based, creative, and innovative approaches to meet students' social, emotional, mental health, and academic needs. To date, all 52 ARP ESSER state plans for every state of the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico have been submitted to the department and 46 plans have been approved. These resources make it possible for students to get what they need, when they need it, and in ways that help them thrive in the classroom and in their lives. Educators are able to teach and lead from a place of opportunity and innovation rather than one of scarcity. At the department, we are committed to maintaining a high level of service to all stakeholders, working to keep students learning safely and to ensuring that every dollar of these funds benefits students as Congress intended. The next step, to in fulfilling our promise of a high quality education for every student is the Build Back Better agenda. By implementing the core tenets of this agenda, we can engage young minds by investing in universal pre-kindergarten and creating clear pathways between the early years of brain development and outcomes in literacy, skills, competency, and matriculation into elementary school and beyond. We can strengthen the relationship among pre-K and K-12 education, higher education, workforce, and our nation's long-term economic health. We can ensure the Department of Education continues to meet the needs of students, educators, and leaders with the resources, expertise, guidance, and support they need to succeed in the 21st century. Last month, I had the opportunity to meet with the National Teachers of the Year. DC Teacher of the Year, Alejandro Diaz Granados, said something that has stuck with me since then and that inspired, inspires my work every day. He said, we as teachers, administrators, and staff work to open schools in the fall, but it's students' love of learning that is keeping them open. We owe it to our students to create educational experiences that are safe, healthy, inspiring, and that they can connect to. We have more work to do, but the progress made is evidence in the joy and experiences of teachers and students around the country sitting in their classrooms right now. We are eager to continue to support them and to build back better together. Thank you, and I look forward to answering your questions. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Martin. And we will now hear from Mr. Kowal. Mr. Kowal, you have five minutes, sir. Good morning, Chair Sablon, Chair Wilson, Ranking Member Owen, Ranking Member Murphy, Chair Scott, Ranking Member Fox, 
and distinguished members of the committee. I commend you for your wisdom and foresight in creating the Higher Education Emergency Relief Fund, which we call HERF. It has made a tremendous difference for college students struggling with the devastating health, economic, and academic impacts of the pandemic and national emergency. HERF has been a lifeline for students facing economic losses due to the pandemic, including many who were homeless or did not have enough to eat. It helps students afford new technology needs and stay enrolled in college. It helped colleges meet urgent public health needs and slow the spread of the pandemic and save the jobs of faculty and staff. In early 2020, as the pandemic swept the country, college students faced the same sudden and severe challenges as other Americans. And yet students were ineligible, or most students were ineligible for much of the financial assistance provided to other Americans, such as the one-time cash payments under the CARES Act. As colleges shifted from in-person to remote instruction overnight, the magnitude and stark inequities of the digital divide were immediately apparent. One student in five reported technology barriers to online learning, and many faculty felt unprepared. Colleges also faced unprecedented financial challenges. Falling enrollments, the potential for state budget cuts, and steep declines in revenue coincided with new pedagogical and public health expenses, such as COVID-19 testing, personal protective equipment, and new or transformed facilities and technology. Past economic recessions had driven up tuition and student debt, doing lasting harm to students. Public colleges and universities, which serve three out of four students, entered the pandemic with historically low per student funding. Recognizing the severity of these challenges, Congress quickly passed bipartisan economic recovery legislation, the first ever to provide relief specifically for colleges, universities, and the students they serve. The third and final law, President Biden's American Rescue Plan, was enacted in March 2021 and contributed more than half of the total $76 billion investment in HERF. HERF has had a real impact on students and their colleges. For example, I recently received a letter from President Daniel Phelan of Jackson College in Michigan describing how HERF helped pay for student tuition and fees, food, housing, course materials, medical and mental health care, and child care. According to a recent survey of college residents, 93% said it funded emergency scholarships and helped retain students at risk of dropping out. 88% said it helped them meet urgent public health needs. And 70% said it helped them continue to employ faculty and staff. In 2020, more than 7 million students received emergency scholarships worth an average of $850 each. Students tell us these dollars had a great impact on their ability not only to survive the pandemic, but to stay in school and remain engaged with their studies. Purple also helped stabilize the perilous finances of many colleges. Earlier this year, Moody's Investor Services cited HERF as a factor in its decision to raise the higher education outlook to stable after years of negative projections. Although we are almost two years into the fight of COVID-19, students still face a long road ahead. Enrollment has fallen by 700,000 students, threatening to leave a permanent dent in our country's educational attainment. Many returning students face continuing financial needs, academic gaps, and mental health challenges. Colleges face revenue losses of between $75 billion and $115 billion over the next five years, as well as new costs for evolving public safety, pedagogical, and workforce needs. The Department of Education staff has worked hard to provide clear, comprehensive guidance to colleges and universities and establish strong internal controls to ensure funds are spent appropriately. We continue to monitor spending patterns, clarify allowable uses of funds, and work with grantees to maximize the impact of these funds. Driving an equitable recovery from the pandemic is a key part of President Biden's vision to build back better. It is the foundation of his strategy to tackle the student debt crisis and build a stronger, more inclusive system of higher education that serves the goals of equity and upward mobility. Working together, we can and we will heal, learn, and grow through this challenging time. I am committed to working collaboratively with members of this committee to strengthen our colleges and universities and help students from all backgrounds earn college degrees and certificates that lead to better jobs and better lives. Thank you for the honor of appearing before you and I look forward to our conversation. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kowal. Um, so um, 
Under committee rule 9A, we will now question witnesses under the five minute rule. After the chairs and ranking members, I will recognize members of both subcommittees in the order of their seniority in on the full committee. Again, to ensure that the members five minute rule is adhered to, staff will be keeping track of time and blinking light will sh uh, show when time has expired. Please be attentive to the time, wrap up when your time is over and remute your microphones. As chairman, I now recognize myself for five minutes. And uh, I now, at this time, I seek unanimous consent to insert into the record a letter to the two subcommittees from Dr. Galvin de Leon Guerrero, a president of the Northern Marianas College. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Kowal, under the CARES Act, 50% of funds received by institutions from the primary, primary allocation formula were required to be spent on emergency financial aid grants to students. The CARES Act also prohibited institutions from helping here funds on contracted recruitment services, endowments and capital spending related to athletics, sectarian instruction and religious worship. How is, the department how is the department monitoring and overseeing institutions compliance with these requirements? Well, thank you for the question, Chair Sablon. And we have worked very hard uh, to make sure that all colleges are spending funds within the allowable uses outlined by Congress. Let me mention a couple of things. First, we publish clear, comprehensive guidance through letters, webinars, and associations. We have created quarterly and annual reporting requirements. We have worked with OMB to designate these funds as high risk, which means their auditors will prioritize them in the annual audit. We've imposed additional oversight for colleges that are financially risky, the ones known as heightened cash monitoring too. We've imposed additional audit requirements on some grantees that are not uh, current, we're not otherwise required to, to conduct audits. And finally, we require for-profit colleges, presidents, and major owners to sign certification forms indicating that they're aware of all the requirements of these funds. Thank you for that. Uh, and let me go now to Ms. Martin. Ms. Martin, I'm encouraged by the department's administration of the uh, American Rescue Plan. And today, all 50 states, plus the Northern Mariana Islands, District of Columbia, and Puerto Rico have submitted a ARP, a a e -S -S -E -R, state plans to the department in line with the agency's interim final requirements. Further, the department has approved 46 ARP ESSER state plans and awarded approximately 91% of ARP ESSER funds to state educational agencies. So my two questions is how is the department ensuring that state plans are consistent with the law and what is the department's plan for ongoing ongoing monitoring as states and districts implement their plans to ensure continued compliance with the law. Thank you so much for your question, Chair Sablon, and recognizing also uh, that your area has um, had that investment and that plan has been approved for the 52 states plans being submitted and that 46 have been approved. And it's so important that these funds are being used in the way intended, which is, first of all, the immediate needs uh, health and safety needs, social, emotional, mental health needs, and academic needs that include learning loss. And we know students need access to those kinds of programs. So the way we ensure that and through monitoring these state plans, first of all, as they come in, to ensure that the state plans include um, the efforts that were intended by the, by the law that you all enacted. And so to make sure that as we, uh, as we look at the plans, we're looking at it through those lenses and then through the monitoring, it's ongoing monitoring. We have both focused and targeted monitoring that's looking at specific when an area needs to be addressed at certain states, we'll look at that. We also have comprehensive monitoring where we're looking at full programmatic areas and then consolidated monitoring. This is super important to us that the updates are done in a way that we have a transparency portal, the Ed Stabilization Fund transparency portal that provides the clarity and transparency for everybody to be able to access that and make sure that the dollars are being used in the in the intended manner. Thank you, thank you. Um, just uh, as a courtesy, uh, as the senior member from the outlying areas from the five insular uh, jurisdictions. Could you please uh, provide uh, under separate cover, provide the committee with the status of, of plans submitted by these outlying areas and, and also the status 
if the department has given its approval to those plans. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We'd be happy to provide that. This. There we go. Um, so I now recognize uh, Ranking Member Owens for five minutes of questions. Uh, Mr. Owens, please. I thank you again, Mr. Chair, and uh, and for the witnesses for being here today. Um, Deputy, Deputy, uh, Deputy Secretary Martin, uh, earlier this year, the department proposed uh, grant priorities. Second, hold tight, hold on, sorry. <clears throat> Earlier this year, the department proposed grant priorities under the American History and Civics Education Program that would have promoted a curriculum in line with uh, critical race theory. The department partially backed off of the worst aspects of this proposal. Still, that move from your agency kicked off a firestone, uh, firestorm of parents concerned about the racist indoctrination of America's public schools. Uh, Deputy Secretary Martin, let's agree that the actual academic theory, theory called critical race theory is not likely being taught in any K through 12 schools. I do not, re I do not dispute that. However, curriculum, the teaching strategies, and professional development inspired by the critical race theory worldview has without question invaded our nation's classrooms. Uh, what is our worldview? Thomas Chatterton Williams summarized the critical race theory view of the world in an essay a few years ago. He said, and I quote, though it is not at all moral equivalent, it is nevertheless in sync with the toxic premise of white supremacists. Both sides eagerly reduce people to abstract color categories, all the while feeding off of and legitimizing each other, while those of us searching for gray areas and common ground get devoured twice. Both sides mystically uh, mystify radical identity, interpreting it as something fixed, determinative, and almost supernatural. It is a dangerous vision of life that we should refuse no matter who is doing the conjuring. Deputy Secretary Martin, will you reject the dangerous and divisive vision of the life embodied in critical race theory as you implement your policies at the uh, Department of Education? Thank you, Mr. Owens, for uh, allowing me to have a conversation about this. I want to make clear that the department is not involved in any curriculum decisions. <laughs> Curriculum decisions are made at the state and the local level, and we trust educators to make those decisions in that context, and it's made based on what students are learning. Okay, well, uh, I, I'm going to disagree in, in one area. Professional development is being uh, uh, pushed at the federal level, so that's a, a conversation we have at another time. Uh, Deputy, uh, one other question here. The Defense of Freedom Institution recently released a, a report titled Teacher Union Resistance to Reopening Schools, an examination of the largest U.S. school districts. That report concluded, and I quote, the record in seven large school districts demonstrates that the teacher union's response to school reopening plans differ only in degree. Regardless of whether the local union was affiliated with NEA or AFT or independent, it also did not matter if the state or local policies were union friendly or not. In no instance did this teachers union ad, ad, uh, advocate for schools to reopen with in-person classroom instruction. On the contrary, there were classrooms instructions, primary opponents during the pandemic, unquote. A separate study from the uh, Annenberg Institute at Brown University found out, and I quote, large school districts where unions were undoubtedly stronger on average are far more likely to heed the preference of unions to keep in-person schooling closed and rely on fully remote models of teaching and learning, unquote. Ms. Martin, what efforts are you willing to take to protect students from the undue in interference of teacher unions in our, in our education? Uh, thank you for your question. What I'm um, happy to point out now at this point, 99.2% of our schools are open for full in-person learning and that that is so important because we know that's where students learn best is in person and following all of the layered mitigation strategies that we know work is what is allowing not only our schools to um, be open but to stay open and doing that in a way that keeps everybody safe including the educators the full school staff the students and the community in which those schools exist that's always critical and the path forward is one that's lined with safety and evidence of what works for schools and the communities in which they exist 
And I appreciate that. Uh, just a real quick question. Obviously, that's where we are moving forward. Uh, my question is, how do we make sure that uh, this influence of the unions are not uh, uh, part of our future uh, process moving forward? Because obviously, it was, it was part of our past. So how do we make sure that doesn't happen again? All decisions around our schools are definitely made at the local level and local communities having the critical conversations. And what I know is that when stakeholders, including the employees, the parents, the students, and everybody in the community at large in which the school exists, the more robust the conversation and inclusive of the people doing the work and the people that are impacted by the work is where we make the best decisions. I think we see that at the local level when local school districts make decisions that are inclusive of all important stakeholders. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Are you back? Thank you, Mr. Owens. Uh, I'd now like to recognize uh, Ms. Wilson, please, for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Kowal, uh, even before the pandemic, we knew that many students aspiring to attend institutions of higher education were having trouble meeting their basic needs, such as housing, food, and transportation. These challenges have grown substantially due to the pandemic. So we used taxpayer dollars to uplift taxpaying families who needed it. Have you heard from colleges and students about how the relief funding provided by Congress has helped them? What lessons have we learned from the pandemic about what students need to not only survive, but thrive in a college environment? And to what extent could institutions and students use additional funds to ensure that their basic needs are not an obstacle to completing their higher education? Chair Wilson, thanks so much for this important question. And it's absolutely the case that even before the pandemic, uh, disturbingly large numbers of students were struggling with uh, homelessness or with food insecurity. And um, in part, of course, the president is working toward um, doubling the Pell Grant. That's a really critical part of it. Um, but colleges also need additional resources to meet the needs of students as they arise. The Pell Grant is based on your financial circumstances and uh, the time you're applying for financial aid may not help you if you lose a job, your parent loses a job, or you face other emergency circumstances. Thank, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, we also know this is uh, for Ms. Martin under the American Rescue Plan, Congress requires state educational agencies to really reserve at least 5% of their total ARP as an allocation to address learning loss and the disproportionate impact of the pandemic on underserved student groups. Likewise, the law requires that districts reserve at least 20% of their ARP ESSER allocation for the same purpose. How is the department monitoring and overseeing this? Can you tell us more about how states and districts are using their ESSER funds and um, let us know what we can do to make governors like Governor DeSantis release money that he's holding up withholding critical ESSA funding for our state. Thank you, Chair Wilson, for the opportunity to talk about this. As you mentioned, the focus on learning loss was intended and it's part of how we review and approve the state plans looking for what you talked about, the 20% being dedicated to that. And just 13 days after the ARP was signed, we sent out $81 billion to states in that first release of funds. And now 95% of the 122 billion of those funds have been released. And as you mentioned, 25%, which is 3.5 billion is directed towards learning loss. And we're monitoring that state by state and LEA by LEA. And we're seeing the ways that we're addressing learning loss. For example, almost 6,000 districts we're using uh, educational technology that was needed for some students to continue their learning. We saw almost 6,000 um, LEAs or local districts spending $377 million just on cleaning and supplies, which was important to get schools open. We know that 99% of the schools being open is critical. But then we got into the most important thing you're talking about, the learning loss, the summer programs. We're seeing summer learning programs, 851 LEAs with 51 million. All of this is available in our trans uh, at the transparency portal that we're monitoring specifically the learning loss because health and safety as that was important to get schools open. Now we need to begin to address their learning loss and whether it's the mental health needs, 
examples as in uh, New York, putting 500 social workers in place to make sure students' social emotional needs are met because we know that that is helpful in addressing their learning needs is making sure their social, emotional, and mental health needs are addressed as well as their academic needs. So state-by-state -state plans are being monitored with the intent of understanding that these dollars are being applied in the way intended, especially around learning loss and that focus. Thank you so much. And I happen to be in a state with a governor that does not understand that and refuses to release the monies to our school districts. Uh, and I hope that the Department of Education will help us with that issue. And the uh, Secretary of Education is lock in lockstep with him. So please help Florida with Governor DeSantis who has withheld our ESSA funds. I'll, I'm gonna try to get this one in. Uh, we're gonna have an onslaught of kindergartners coming into our schools because of universal pre-K. Have schools been uh, notified or it states getting, what are they doing to prepare for these kindergartners? Full day universal kindergarten, not have to. Ms. Martin, maybe you could provide Ms. Wilson that um, an answer to that question, uh, please. Uh, we gotta move, we gotta move on. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Um, uh, Dr. Murphy, um, sir, you have five minutes for questioning, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank the uh, witnesses for coming today. Um, one of the things that has troubled me for many years since being on the college, uh, our board of a college trustee at uh, my alma mater, was the problem with free speech on campus. I've actually been told in this committee that free speech, the free speech issue is not um, a problem or, a, or a, a problem on college campuses. Yet we held a round table a couple of weeks ago with institutions like Princeton, Yale, William and Mary Davidson. Um, and we had a, a, a plethora of students and uh, um, other individuals that talked about episodes that occur on campuses daily, bullying, canceling, um, et cetera, that goes on uh, regarding to uh, the abuses and attacks that occur um, that students are, are not able to have free speech. So Mr. Caval, I'd like to ask you, um, do you agree that public institutions of higher education should abide by the First Amendment? Yes, my, thank you, Dr. Murphy, for the question. My understanding is that is the law. That is the law, but do you agree that that's, uh, that should be done by um, colleges and, and institutions of higher learning? I do. I think the free speech is um, an incredibly important concept for our society and our de democracy. It's a foundational value. I think it is particularly important on college campuses, and we need to support free inquiry um, while also maintaining spaces that make everyone feel safe and welcome. Uh, it, it's always troubling to me to hear that they're quote free speech zones on campuses. It's it, it just I make I shake my head. Why, why isn't everywhere on campus a free speech zone? Um, do you agree that uh, we should do anything possible to perfect uh, to protect free speech, um, whether a student or a professor likes to hear what the person is saying or not? Well, again, I do think that um, maintaining free speech is really important on college campuses, and we need to do that within a safe and welcoming environment. Um, the Department of Education does not set a policy regulating speech on college campuses. Um, if there were a case where, uh, you know, a court were to determine um, that a college had violated the First Amendment, then we would certainly look at that. Um, but that is our, that's what our role is in the area of free speech. All right, well, thank you, because I, I think, you know, there's been a large swell of uh, alumni groups now in the country because seemingly this is a lot of uh, college presidents, universities, and other faculty members are tone deaf to the screaming that many students are, are, are saying on college campuses that they're being canceled or that they cannot exhibit their um, true opinions in class for fear they'll have their grades altered or uh, being condemned by other students because anybody who says that's not a problem is not living in the real world. So I think that colleges and universities are, are going to see a swell. And we actually saw a group that was published in the Wall Street Journal of five universities that has now swelled to over 90 universities where alumni are, uh, are actually walking away with their feet and with their uh, 
with their resources because of the lack of free speech on campus. My particular alma mater, in my opinion, has given a lip service to that such. So it's very, it's going to be very interesting because I think this is going to be a First Amendment issue um, that goes on on college campuses. So let me ask you another question. Um, I know that you guys don't quote enact the policy, but do you believe that students should have the right to sue their college and university if they feel their First Amendment rights are being violated? Um, well, Dr. Murphy, I have to say I haven't studied that uh, question. Um, it's clear to me that you've thought a lot about this and you're very well informed and I welcome the opportunity to have further conversations with you about it. And that's fine. I, I mean, I'll, I'll take that as a yes, but because it is a free speech issue, you know, we want everybody to speak, whether they be communists, whether they be the other side of the political spectrum or not. It is not a cancel place to go on campus. This is where you're supposed to grow your mind. You're supposed to not be told what to think. You're supposed to be taught how to think. And um, it comes, leadership comes from the top down and it comes from you guys as the Department of Education that you should be espousing that free speech should not have zones on campuses. It should actually have every classroom and every step and place on the campus. So I appreciate your leadership in that matter. It's going to be a big deal. And I think it's going to be a bigger and bigger deal as we saw that parents and everybody else see what's going on in classrooms as we move forward in this, uh, in this country. With that, Mr. Chairman, it looks like my time's up and I will yield back. Thank you. Um, I, let me now recognize Mr. Courtney. Mr. Courtney, you have five minutes for questioning, please. Great, well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for, to the witnesses for being here today to you know, really dive into a really important topic. Um, you know, across my district, seeing the uh, American Rescue Plan funding uh, deployed in school districts like uh, the town of Enfield, which uh, put a lot of its, or a chunk of its money towards a summer program to address learning loss, which I attended. And you could feel the energy, positive energy in the room with kids who were together again, and um, who again, were, were there really, I think, uh, very engaged in, in, in their classwork. Uh, in the town of Salem, one of my favorite uh, programs was a parent academy that was stood up to uh, again, help connect parents uh, to their kids' uh, school issues. Uh, I think all of us can agree that's the healthiest way for school districts to engage uh, parents as an important stakeholder in terms of making sure kids uh, succeed. And in the town of Vernon, they boosted, which where I live, their uh, social worker staff to again, help kids deal with the social emotional fallout from uh, the pandemic. But one other aspect of the rescue plan, uh, Ms. Martin, which I wanted to uh, talk about with you for a moment, was that um, you know, as, as long as I've been in Congress, there has been a hue and cry about the fact that uh, special education has been underfunded. Uh, it has not matched the mandate when Gerald Ford, President Gerald Ford signed it into law. Uh, there was $3 billion new dollars that was put into the special ed uh, funding, which uh, now in Connecticut is going to be to you know, help every single district. Maybe you could just talk a little bit about that, particularly that population, which took a real hit uh, during the pandemic in terms of uh, keeping them uh, engaged uh, with their schoolwork. programs and the things that you highlighted and specifically the $3 billion of the ARP funds that are identified for nearly 8 million students with disabilities. Part of what's baked into our approach and the funding streams here is to address those who are most disproportionately impacted by what they've been through. And so specifically students with disabilities, we understand what, what they've experienced and some of the state plans have to specifically address those needs. We focus on everything needs to be evidence-based. It has to address the social, emotional, and mental health needs of students, as well as if there's a disproportionate impact like we saw with students with disabilities. And so we're seeing state by state, the plans are intended to address those. I've seen, I, I can say from a personal level, I'm a sibling of a person with developmental disabilities. It's my older brother. And I understand as states develop with the specific intention, I think it was smart that we set, made sure that $3 billion were allocated because there's 8 million students with disabilities that were disproportionately impacted. And so the kinds of things that they need are decided school by school, state by state with the student in mind. And we say we need to know our students by name and by need and design what's gonna best help them individually recover what's been missing for them. 
So I hope the department, uh, because again, you described it, you know, perfectly in terms of the value of that um, priority. It's just that you know we can maybe get the you know sort of a analysis of, of the impact because uh, again, this has been a just a persistent nagging issue about the fact that for school districts who uh, again don't dispute the need for helping kids with special learning plans, but you know again. It, it can get real expensive uh, to make sure that we understand how this really worked in terms of uh, Washington, you know, really living up to uh, the mandate that was created. And uh, and again, I know in the fiscal year 22 budget that the president sent over, there was an increase in special ed, which again has been basically flatlined for for decades. Um, so anyway, kudos to to the department for for working on that. Um, Mr. Kaval, it's great to see you again. Uh, congratulations on you know being back in the saddle. Um, you know, as we look at the rescue plan money and the other. Um, you know, higher ed funding, which again, some of it went directly to, to students. Has there been any sort of, um, you know, sort of data in terms of what that's done in terms of student borrowing? Because, um, you know, clearly this was direct cash grant money that, um, you know, colleges were able to, to get out to kids. Um, you know, whether or not that, you know, is going to show up in terms of any reduced uh, borrowing um, for, you know, the last 18 months, uh, two years, because, um, you know, again, as we talk about the Pell Grant initiative and Build Back Better, I mean, that's obviously part of the benefit, which is to reduce student loan borrowing. Mr. Courtney, thanks so much for the question. I know you're a longtime leader and have some real uh, ambitious proposals in the area of student debt. Uh, we uh, don't have data yet to suggest what impact this has had on borrowing levels. Obviously, students had a lot of additional expenses, lost jobs, uh, new technology needs, uh, new housing costs. Um, so we'll have to wait and see uh, until the numbers come in, um, whether that was a net positive or negative on student debt. Great. Well, thank, thank you. you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, I'm now like to recognize Mr. Allen. Mr. Allen, you have five minutes of questioning, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank both Secretary Martin and Under Undersecretary uh, Kowal for uh, uh, being with us today. Uh, in my home state of Georgia, both K through 12 schools and our university system uh, did an excellent job of re reopening schools in 2020 and have been trying to get COVID funds out the door as uh, quickly as possible. And I want to give uh, a, a, a great uh, credit to our administration and all those who work tirelessly to get our schools open under a difficult uh, situation there are remaining questions that need to be answered by the department, and I'm submitting several questions for the record for uh, from our institutions. And I would like both of you to commit to responding to these questions in a timely manner. Would you agree to do that? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Great. Uh, Deputy Secretary Martin, earlier this year, our committee heard testimony from parents of children with disabilities harmed by their states and school districts refusal to provide adequate in-person instruction. One parent testified about her family's experiences in Oregon, Oregon and said, my middle daughter is Lizzie, age nine, in the third grade, and Lizzie has Down syndrome. She is a hidden victim of pandemic policies and prolonged school closures. She has been denied services mandated by the uh, IEP, unquote. Another parent testified about his experiences in Virginia and said, quote, our son is diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder and ADHD. Before school closed due to the pandemic, he was a very happy boy who loved school, especially being around his friends, but things changed quickly after schools closed. During the fall, as we watched him deteriorate before our, eye, our very eyes and not be able to engage in virtual learning, we pleaded with school administrators to open schools for in-person learning for students with disabilities which aligned with the guidelines by the Virginia Department of Health. Ms. Martin, how many investigations has the department launched of school districts that refuse to provide students with disabilities the education and services they are entitled to under federal law? Thank you for bringing up the important topic of students with disabilities and making sure that their needs are being met as required by law. That's yeah, How many investigations have you launched into this problem? Uh, I don't know the answer to the number of investigations, but I'm happy to have staff follow up with you on the exact number of okay. investigations. All right. uh, I would appreciate that and uh, the, the uh, extent of those investigations. 
Uh, on the other hand, the department initiated investigations of nine states into alleged violations of Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 due to those states' masking policies. <clears throat> Committee Republicans sent Secretary Cardona a letter on September 1st asking substantive questions about the legal interpretation underpinning those investigations. It's now two and a half months later and we still have not received a response. However, in an interview with Axios in October, Secretary Cardona said that it was unlikely any federal funds would be withheld from states or school districts over mass mandate. Was that an admission from the secretary that these investigations were political? And would that be a yes or a no? So, uh, thank you, sir, for the question. It's a little bit more complicated than a simple yes or no. Uh, what I will say is that a safe path to reopening and following all of the guidance that we know gives students access to in-person learning, as you pointed out, is so important. And so we're gonna to continue to support looking at safe paths to reopening and implementing the best protocols that are recommended by the CDC. When those are not being used, we will investigate. Okay, so how would I interpret that? <laughs> I'm sorry, sir. It's, yeah, sometimes it, it's it, not as simple as yes or no, but I yeah, do Was that an admission from the secretary that these investigations were political? Well, sir, it's important that we have the safest path forward and that this okay. is not about political, it's about safety All for right. our schools, our students, and their communities. Okay, Ms. Martin, uh, I have just one more question. Thank you. Um, why has the department been more, why hasn't the department been more aggressive over masking policies than it has been, uh, than it has been over school districts refusal to stir, uh, serve students with disabilities? Uh, it's about a safe path for all students, and there's not a difference between students with disabilities or safety around masking or the mitigations. We're following the science and the recommendations that when mitigations are put in place, students have access to their learning, schools can open and stay open, and that's what we want for all children in our country. Yeah, but we've seen the results of this uh, issue with students of disabil with disabilities, I, you know, but anyway, I, I'm out of time. Thank you so much, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, thank, thank you. you thank you, um, Mr. I'm, I now recognize Ms. Bonamici for five minutes of questioning, please. Thank you so much to the chairs and ranking members, and thank you to our witnesses from the Department of Education. We know that the COVID-19 pandemic has been an unprecedented public health crisis. And in response, the country took steps to mitigate the spread of the virus. And that included closing schools and transitioning students to remote learning. Congress created the Education Stabilization Fund through the CARES Act at the beginning of the pandemic. And then the, this past March, we passed the American Rescue Plan and the additional robust investment in our K-12 system. And these funds have helped districts reopen schools safely, keep schools open and make up for lost instructional time. And, and the resources have really been a lifeline for our nation's schools, providing critical supports, for example, in Oregon's first congressional district, which I'm honored to represent, the Tiger Development School District, was able to create a K-12 virtual school for families who were not ready to have their students return to the classroom in person. Funding was used to hire the additional teachers and support staff to serve more than 600 students. And in the Hillsboro School District, funds were used to expand their a very successful bilingual and math summer intervention programs that help address unfinished learning among their students with the highest needs. So I want to ask first, Ms. Martin, what data has the department collected about how states and districts are using or plan to use your American Rescue Plan funds? And can you point to any best practices for programs and investments that have been the most successful? Yes, thank you. You actually started to answer the question with some of the best practices that you've seen in your state. And that's what we want to do is lift up those practices that address how these funds are intended, the programs in the state plans, they give us a great window into what states are doing and how they're using the funds as intended. The programs and the actions and services need to be evidence-based. They need to address social emotional needs of students. They need to address those that are most disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. All of those state plans, when you start to unpack them and have great programs like you just uplifted, give us a whole database of what we're seeing out there. And there's a clearinghouse where we're able to share best practices, provide technical assistance, hold webinars so that 
we can share across the country what we hear people doing uh, using the funds in, in the ways that are intended in Oregon. Yeah, that's example, really helpful. I, I just want to note too that, that what we all know is that the pandemic did not affect all, all communities and school districts the same way. I mean, I had conversations in school districts with high populations of uh, Latino students and many of their students had lost family members. They weren't ready to come back to school at the same time as, as students in other communities. And I, I wanna use up the rest of my time um, to ask questions to Mr. Cabal. It's really nice to see you again. Um, congratulations on your position at the Department of Education. You know, because the pandemic required a move to digital and remote learning, in so many instances, ed education technology providers and online program managers have seen an increase in the number of contracts with school districts and institutes of institutions of higher education. So how is the department monitoring both education technology providers, OPM, and is the department planning to issue guidance to school districts and colleges about how to approach these relationships and really guarantee the quality of education? Thanks, Ms. Bonamici. I really appreciate um, the question and your long-term leadership in higher education issues. Um, of course, there has been uh, a big trend toward online education, especially for working adults in recent years. And then over the course of the pandemic, a big sudden shift to online for everybody else. In my conversations with college presidents, it doesn't sound like they're planning to go back to traditional classroom, um, at least to the full extent that it was before, but they're explain, exploring hybrid and other options. You're absolutely right that a big part of this trend has been private companies called online program managers who work with colleges uh, to put those programs online. This is a real interest of ours. We're working very hard to highlight the good practices in the areas of online and try and make the most out of it. And where online is not serving students well, we're going to be very aggressive. Rich Cordray has set up a new enforcement unit, and I imagine that will be an area that he is looking at. We're also starting a new regulatory process in just a couple of months um, that will look at some related issues. Thank you. Obviously, there are significant equity issues. Um, one of the reasons I was so excited to help pass the bipartisan infrastructure bill is because of the broadband investments that to, that will be made, uh, and and that's just one of the inequities that the the pandemic uh, exposed and highlighted. That online learning doesn't work if people don't have the connectivity. And Mr. Gabal, I also want to ask you. I, I know in in Oregon, enrollment is down particularly at community colleges. And I'm concerned about the, as a graduate of a community college myself, I'm concerned about the declining enrollment and how that will affect our community colleges. And I just want to ask, how, how will the Build Back Better Act, particularly the community college industry partnership grants that will help uh, create those uh, paths to a good job for, for uh, so many across the country as we transition to a clean energy economy, how, how will that help enrollment with the, the declining yeah. enrollment? Mr. Mr. Kowal, maybe you could provide that. Oh, goodness. Answer. I see I'm over time. If you could please submit that for the record, I apologize, Mr. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I look forward to receiving that answer on the record. Thank you. All right. I'm, I now recognize uh, the member from Indiana, Mr. Banks. You have five minutes of questioning, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to discuss the, the reporting requirements for institutions who receive gifts or donations from foreign entities. The Chinese Communist Party's influence on college and university campuses across the country through indoctrination and coercion using Confucius Institutes and the theft of sensitive information and research by way of that co coercion and other tactics um, is alarming to say the least. Mr. Kual, the Trump administration took steps to ensure schools were following statutorily mandated reporting requirements with respect to foreign gifts and donations while also making public on a regular basis these disclosures. I bring this up because it appears that for whatever reason, schools have reported significantly less foreign gifts and donations since President Biden took office. In fact, between July 1, 2020 and January 20, 2021, U.S. schools reported $1.6 billion in foreign gifts. Since January 20th, however, schools have reported just $2.2 million in gifts over a much longer period of time. Moreover, it is my understanding that this administration has not launched a single new investigation into foreign funding in universities. Mr. Quall, has the department continued President Trump's approach to enforcing these requirements? Mr. Banks, for raising this very important issue, and I agree that there is real reason for concern 
uh, about federal government seeking to inappropriately or secretly access U.S. research and technology. When it comes to Section 117, my belief is that most universities want to comply with these requirements. I talked to college presidents who are confused about the requirements are. So we're committed to working with them to make sure that they fully and completely follow the law. And of course, if they willfully refuse to follow the law, there will be consequences. What, what do you make of that discrepancy? It's significant, well, I, really. One, $1.6 billion in foreign gifts reported between July 1, 2020 and January 20, 2021. But since you've been uh, and what, since you've been uh, in your role, only $2.2 million has been reported. I mean, what, what do we make of that discrepancy? Well, I, I hadn't heard those numbers before. Um, assuming those numbers are accurate, I agree with you. Those raised some questions, and I'd be delighted to look into them with and get back to you on. Has the department launched any new investigations into schools' compliance with Section 117 since Biden has taken office? I'm not familiar with that answer, but I'd be I'd be glad to get back to you and talk to you more about that. Has the department continued any existing investigations from the previous administration? Uh, I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that, you know, I agree with you, this is an important challenge. We're committed to working with colleges and universities to make sure they comply with Section 117. And I'd be glad to work with your office to make sure that we have whatever tools we need uh, to enforce the law. Uh, since you're not informed about um, any new investigations, any old investigations, or discrepancies between uh, the drastic uh, difference between what was reported last year and, and uh, this year, would you commit to getting back to us on the record to answer those questions? Yes, I'd be delighted to. Um, and, and will you commit to following up with my office and the committee over the next week and provide detailed answers as to the status of Section 117 reporting and investigations, including the number of cases pending and ongoing investigations? Yes. Um, uh, another subject, according to the American Academy of Pediatrics, between 0.01% and 2% of COVID cases in children resulted in hospitalization. Between one and 4% of total COVID hospitalizations were children. Despite these shockingly low numbers, students from kindergarten to college have been shuttered inside their homes and forced to participate in learning online for what will be two years or more. According to a study by the Northwest Evaluation Association, reading scores for students in grades three through eight were six percentile points lower, and math scores have dropped by 12 percentage points. Ms. Mar Mrs. Martin, what metric is your department using to determine success versus failure of COVID relief programs? Thank you so much for that question. And looking at specifically the way we're implementing these dollars to make sure students are able to be in-person learning because we know that is the best chances for them to learn. Um, and the safe path to reopening is to put in place all of the mitigation strategies, including masking, testing, ventilation, and Mrs. Martin, how, how can parents know that COVID relief funds have had a net, net positive impact on their children? Through our ongoing monitoring of the funds, we will be able to provide that through the transparency portal. Thank you. My time has expired. Thank you. Um, I now recognize Ms. Hayes. Ms. Hayes saw five minutes. So, oh, hold on, Mr. Takano. Mr. Takano, you have five minutes of questionings. My apologies, Johanna. Well, thank you. I forgot that my uh, camera was uh, not turned on. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Kowal, uh, Congress has provided three large infusions of money into higher education through the CARES Act, CRRSA, and the American Rescue Plan, totaling more than $76 billion. Can you tell us more about how HERE funds, H-E-E-R funds, have been used to support students and ensure the health and safety of the campus community? Well, Mr. Kano, thanks so much um, for that question. And, you know, we've seen uh, her funds make a tremendous difference for students in the area of emergency scholarships and technology needs that help them survive the pandemic and stay enrolled. We've seen them uh, help colleges keep staff and faculty employed during difficult challenges. And we see colleges using the funds to institute uh, uh, public health measures that slow the spread of the pandemic, both on campus and in their communities. So uh, for example, Amarillo College has used her funds to hire case managers that help students connect to the resources in the broader community to make sure that they're not left homeless 
or needing food insecurity. Uh, Fort Lewis College, which is a Native American serving college, has used these resources to help deal with the mental health challenges facing their students, especially Native American students. And of course, colleges are investing in things like testing, contact tracing, uh, PPE, uh, new facilities, new educational equipment. So these funds are making a tremendous difference every day on college campuses across the country. Well, well thank you, Mr. Kowal. Uh, Ms. Martin, Title I of the Elementary and Secondary Act of 1965, or ESEA, requires that only students with the most significant cognitive disabilities may take an alternative assessment and provides that no more than 1% of all students in the grades assessed can be assessed using an alternative assessment. An alternative assessment. This requirement was first in effect for the 2017-2018 school year. And at that time, most states were, were exceeding this percentage. The department recently created guidance regarding alternative assessments that indicates that given the disruption caused by COVID-19, states following procedures outlined in the letter can expect to receive a waiver of this requirement. Now this flexibility may be necessary under the circumstances, but in real terms, it means more students with disabilities who will not be, uh, will not, who will not be assessed may lose access to the general education curriculum and will be on track to receiving a certificate of completion rather than a standard diploma. Given the need for flexibility this year, how do we ensure that students with disabilities receive the appropriate services and supports they need to make academic progress in the general curriculum and graduate with a standard diploma? Thank you for bringing up this very specific issue that's incredibly important for students with disabilities, especially most severe disabilities. I can say that the department is very committed to supporting the states so that they will fulfill the requirements that are in ESEA, that only students with the most significant cognitive disabilities can take the alternative assessment. And that's totaling no more than 1% of students, as you mentioned, in the grades that are assessed. So the, alter the alternate assessment is based on the alternate, alternate achievement standards. And that's designed to be appropriate only for students that have the significant cognitive disability. So we need to make sure we're staying within what it was designed for. Students with other disabilities that might represent a vast majority, they represent the mass, vast majority of students with disabilities who receive special education services should not be assessed to that standard. It's a different standard that was meant for students with the most severe disabilities. That's not changed and that has not been waived, nor will it be. Thank you so much for the response. Mr. Kowal, I want to go back to uh, uh, to build on your response. Is it fair to say that uh, the HERE funds have actually, in terms of facilitating the purchase of PPE testing uh, capacity, uh, that those HERE funds have been really critical in terms of schools being able to open up uh, safely, that universities and colleges have been able to safely open up uh, because of these federal funds? Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Takano. That's what I hear from college presidents that's made a tremendous ability in their efforts to keep students and faculty and staff safe on their campuses. So really it's, it, you know, the federal assistance has really been critical in terms of educational institutions, whether it's K uh, through 12 or higher ed, that, that this has been essential in order for, for, uh, for them to be open. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. All right. Thank you. Um, I'd now like to recognize the ranking member of the full committee, uh, Ms. Fox, for five minutes of questioning. Yeah. Ms. Fox? I, yes, sir. Thank All you, right. Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Qual, my staff received an email last night from the department that seems to indicate that the department is finally willing to release the unredacted copy of the student loan value report with us. Can you confirm we'll receive a copy of FSA's report as well as other accompanying reports and relevant documents within the next month? Yes. It is a shame you stonewall this committee, but more importantly, taxpayers for over six months. So with your 11th hour response, I'd like to discuss your role as it relates to congressional oversight more broadly. Mr. Qual, at your confirmation hearing before the Senate Health Committee on April 12th, 20, 21, 
April 21, 2021, Ranking Member Burr asked if you would commit to providing Senator Burr and his staff with, quote, the information that he or the minority members of the committee request from you or the Department of Education in the requested time frame, end quote, to which you responded, I do. Committee has sent several letters to the department that pertain to issues under your portfolio, including several with Senator Burr. While the department has raised to provide responses to some of those before this hearing and the hearing with Mr. Cordray, the responses are hardly worth the time it took to send them. Many of them provided zero information or responses to the questions asked. That is hardly in line with the commitment you made that day during your hearing. You also committed to providing the Government Accountability Office with information and documents when they are requested. Have you ensured your office and those you oversee are providing all documents requested by GAO is there any request your office or those you oversee has not have not provided the requested document? And if so, why? Well, Ms. Fox, thank you so much uh, for the question. Um, I absolutely do appreciate Congress's appropriate role in overseeing the work of the Department of Education. And I think it is incumbent upon us to answer your uh, questions. Just, just to answer the question, yeah. Have, have you given well, everything to the GAO? Well, I have I regularly meet with uh, the Office of the General Counsel and the others who work with the GAO on those inquiries. And my understanding is we're working with the GAO to fully satisfy their request. Okay. Well, we agree on the critical aspect of uh, making this republic work because of oversight that Congress has. So will you commit to us today to ensure timely responsive replies to our request from this point forward? I do. Will you please provide a follow-up on how you communicate this to your team and the offices you're charged with overseeing and include how you intend to ensure compliance with your directives? Yes, I'd be glad to. We can resend our request or you can go back and answer our questions. Will you provide answers to every outstanding the question the, com the committee has sent to the department as well as any and all documents requested prior to this hearing by the end of next week? Uh, well, uh, we will provide them to you as quickly as possible. Okay, so that's a no. Um, so Deputy Secretary Martin, earlier this year, the department sent letters to Texas and Florida implying that the department could impose new requirements on COVID aid related to state's masking policies. I wrote a letter to Secretary Cardona asking for clarification on the department's policy. Secretary Cardona sent a response letter, but that letter did not answer the questions. Let me ask you those questions, and I'd appreciate a forthright answer. First, are states required as a condition of state receipt of ARP ESSER funds to allow school districts to mandate the use of masks? Yes or no? We, we're following the science on math, masks and we can't compromise on student health and safety with masking. When it comes to masking- That's not a will, yes or no, uh, so then it must be a no. Uh, Second, uh, under section 2001 I of the American Rescue Plan uh, Act, school districts were required to make publicly available a plan for the safe return uh, to in-person instruction. Has the department required those plans to include policies mandating the universal wearing of masks in schools? Yes or no? Safely reopening schools includes wearing masks that we, has proven to help. And will you share with us the Thank science you. that backs up what you're saying since you say you're following the science? We know that you all are selective in following science. So we want to see the science you're Please. following. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will uh, back. Thank you, uh, Ms. Fox. Uh, I now recognize uh, the chairman of the full committee, uh, Mr. Scott, for five minutes of questioning. Ms. Hayes is next. I mean, will come. Mr. Scott, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize. The lights went out in this part of the um, Rayburn office building, so we're sitting here in the dark. 
Um, and I think um, as I was getting back on my phone rather than the computer, that Mrs. Martin was explaining the total costs and why it was so expensive to open schools safely, keep them open safely, and, um, and make up for learning loss. And I would ask her if those costs, um, Ms. Martin included the cost of ventilation. Yes, sir, thank you. Um, I'm sorry that you're in the dark right now, but we'll try to answer the questions for you. Yes, absolutely. Uh, safely reopening schools is, is, the path, is the path forward. And initially schools being able to spend dollars for the physical safety of the schools, whether that was protective equipment or ventilation or filtration systems, the dollars were absolutely intended for what local needs would be for the physical structures to safely reopen. And absolutely, we saw including ventilation. And did that include mental health and, and health care? Yes, the second aspect that's critically important and it's hard to put them in order, but the safety, physical safety of the schools and the implementing all the mitigation impact, mitigation efforts was number one. And second, right in line with it was the social, emotional, and mental health needs of our students. And all of the state plans that have been submitted must show how they were going to be implementing and addressing students' social, emotional, mental health needs. And I think I'll tell you what the third one is, but you're probably about to ask it. Well, go ahead. <laughs> uh, the, 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 make, another make very important aspect. Off. Exactly. Yes, sir. The very important, third important aspect of the way these funds need to be directed and the way that the state plans need to indicate is evidence based ways that we are addressing learning loss and giving students opportunities, whether that's through summer programs or extensive tutoring programs, where we're seeing some districts have changed class sizes to give smaller student teacher ratios. Each local LEA is deciding how to address the needs of specifically on learning loss where those who are most significantly and disproportionately impacted, the plans need to show how those students who are most significantly impacted, especially have um, plans in place to address their learning losses. And we're seeing that all, all across the states um, that built into their plans as required. Thank you. The uh, American Rescue Plan had a provision that required maintenance of equity. Can you tell me what that is and why it's important? That's another part of the learning loss approach to it. Maintenance of equity was specifically built into this because we wanted to make sure that those that were most disproportionately affected were going to be able to have the resources that they need to improve and to recover. And this pandemic has been across, is worldwide but the disproportionate impacts this maintenance of equity is intended to make sure that we are addressing student by name and by need and where there's greater need, there must be greater investment and we must maintain an equitable approach so that when districts are designing their plans, they're understanding those who are most negatively or significantly impacted, the dollars are being directed to them and the maintenance of equity approach is designed to do that. Thank you and I'm running out of time, but I. You just assume you, you're providing localities with best practices and for those that are wasting the money, you're getting their names in the paper? Yes, sir. It's very, it's the, the, the law is very clear on what these funds are intended for and they're clear for a reason. So that is our job is to have technical assistance, guidance. We've just released um, guidance, multiple documents around the best use of the funds. And so there's a plethora of resources for states and districts to know how to direct the funds in the ways intended. And uh, that's, that's our job is to provide those resources and uh, best practices. Thank you. And Mr. Uh, Kowal, in, in a reconciliation plan, we couldn't uh, get into much uh, discussion about how to separate good for-profits from bad for-profits. And so the decision was made not to let the uh, any for profits benefit from the increase in Pell Grants. Uh, can you commit to working with us so we can separate the good from the bad so that uh, the good for profits can can benefit? Yes, I commit to working with you on that. Okay, and um, what is being done to prepare students for the resumption of student loan payments um, to make sure that they're prepared and they are getting into the uh, appropriate uh, repayment plans like uh, public service loan forgiveness and others and are you working on uh, what authority you can exercise in terms of combining loans refinancing loans and uh, reducing interest rates 
Uh, Mr. Scott, the answer is uh, we, we are doing quite a bit of work. We consider this to be one of the most significant challenges that we have faced in the history of the student aid programs. And um, we've already begun reaching out to students. We've already begun exploring everything we can do within the authority provided by Congress and would be delighted to share additional information with you either you. in the record or uh, in a briefing. Thank you. Thank, thank you. I think a briefing would be would be good. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Chairman Scott. Um, I now recognize the gentle lady, the member from New York, Mr. Stefanik, for five minutes, please. Thank you very much. When Congress passed the Bipartisan CARES Act in March of 2020, New York State received over $1 billion to help K-12 schools address the many unprecedented challenges they faced during the early months of the pandemic. Yet New York State quickly offset this funding to fill a pre-existing hole in the state budget and then moved to withhold even more funding from schools. This left many schools in my district under-resourced as they strive to keep students on track and began returning to in-person learning in the fall of 2020, which was ahead of many schools across the country. With this unprecedented amount of taxpayer funding Congress has since provided to K-12 schools, it is critical that this funding reaches the local level without being offset and that it is used as intended by Congress to address learning loss and advance student success. My question is for Ms. Martin. How is the department enforcing the maintenance of effort requirements that accompany the COVID-19 relief funds to ensure funding is not captured by states like New York seeking to solve their self-made fiscal problems? Thank you for this important question. The implementation of the law as written is critical to us. We understand the law and it's our job to make sure the states are following it as we provide uh, monitoring and oversight of that. And we will work with your state as well as every other state closely. Our staff works with this, um, each state to ensure that they're following as intended. It's critical. And my follow-up to that, Ms. Martin, would be that the department is not going to consider waivers to these fiscal requirements and let states displace the education funding like New York did. Is that accurate? Did you hear that question? Hello? Hello? Uh, can the timer be paused at this time, please? Um, in fairness to Mr. Flick. The screen froze for a moment right as, um, can you hear us? Yes, yeah. I can hear you. Can you hear me? You froze for a moment. I apologize. You were right in the middle of a really important question, but you're, I can hear you now and you can finish the question. <laughs> Great. My question was, the department does not intend to issue waivers uh, to states like New York that are uh, displacing this education funding. Is that accurate? To my knowledge, that is accurate. Okay. And then my second question is, Section 1116 of ESSA, as updated by this committee in 2015 with the bipartisan passage, requires schools and districts that accept the over $16 billion in annual federal assistance through the Title I program to have a parental engagement policy. Specifically, schools must hold an annual meeting with parents to explain their rights to be involved, provide parents with a description and explanation of the curriculum being taught, and provide parents opportunities for regular meetings to participate in decisions relating to the education of our children. Ms. Martin, how is the department ensuring schools and districts are upholding these obligations under section 1116 to involve parents in educational decision making? Thank you for the important question about parent to sit, parents being involved in decision making. And part of the, all of the state plans that have been submitted specifically for the ARP funds required that there was engagement with parents and other stakeholders. And that, that, that's baked into when we review the plans. If that's missing, we have to be in dialogue with the states to ensure that they've followed that expectation. As one example, we absolutely believe that parents pay, play a critical role. And these are baked into what you've just, what you've just uh, shared for a reason. And we, it's our job to make sure it's being followed. And if it comes to the department's attention that the school does not have a parental engagement policy, what are the steps the department takes? Did this freeze again?
Um, Mr. Kowal, Ms. Martin, do you? Hello? Can you hear me, Mr. Chair? Yes, I can. Okay. I will submit that for the record, Mr. Chair, uh, okay. while we wait for the technical issues to be worked out. Thank you, yield back. Back again, so I heard you say you're gonna submit a question for the record. I'll be happy to answer that. I'm sorry that the technology froze. I yield right. back. Thank you, thank you, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to now recognize, well, I think um, Mrs. Hayes was very patient. Uh, let me see, Mrs. Hayes. All right, so um, now I recognize Ms. Teresa, um, Ms. Ledger Fernandez, who knows timing very well. Now for five minutes, please. Thank you so very much, uh, Chair, and it's wonderful to see you here in DC. Uh, can't wait <laughs> to, uh, to see you on the floor. And thank you so much, Deputy Secretary Martin and Undersecretary Kual for joining us today um, in your important work to bring the much needed aid to our American students. You know, this pandemic laid a bare pre-existing inequities in every aspect of our society but perhaps most notably in our schools and in the schools we have in New Mexico, which includes so many Title I schools, you know, students who were already struggling because of lack of access to technology or broadband were shut out, right? They didn't have access to remote learning. They received um, lesson plans from a bus. Uh, Hemis Valley Public Schools, as an example, 25% of our students um, especially in Hemis and Zio Pueblos, did not have access to the internet. Um, my state of New Mexico has struggled to administer education equitably in the past. Native American, Latino, and students with disabilities actually sued uh, and won a lawsuit uh, to say that the state was not providing an adequate education. That's the Yazi Martinez lawsuit. There was reference to it earlier in um, the testimony. Um, so, you know, we are now faced with an opportunity as the new funding comes in to address uh, things like the Yazi Martinez uh, lawsuit. Uh, and I'm really glad to see that there were set aside requirements for the underserved student groups, because uh, this is exactly for the Yazi Martinez students. Um, so I do wanted to have some discussion uh, about how these funds could be used to address those kinds of discrepancies. And given that the, uh, the Department of Education is aware of that loss and those discrepancies, um, how you think that that, uh, how you think that that might have, you know, how that could happen. So Ms. Martin, uh, what tools does the Department of Education have to assist or encourage New Mexico to address the Yazi deficiencies? Thank you for, for highlighting some of the really significant disparities that were, like you said, laid bare during this pandemic, that we were all in the same storm, but not all in the same, same boat. And as we're addressing, as we're addressing the pandemic, there's specific, um, the funds are available in ways to meet the needs at the community level and community by community, school by school, neighborhood by neighborhood, the needs are different. So we're not intending to pretend like we know the answer for every community. I can say that specifically, the plans are including ways to address the things that are like laid out in that suit that you mentioned, but specifically being able to purchase educational technology, hardware, software, connectivity is one of the ways that we're spending, that we're seeing the dollars being spent and directed, but they're decided locally what is standing in the way of a student accessing their education and what kinds of barriers need to be removed and how can the funding address those barriers. And we're providing the technical assistance, the guidance, and um, nationwide webinars where people can tune in with each other and help each other with some of the smart and innovative wise actions they're taking to use the funds to address the disparities that frankly were there before the pandemic, but definitely the funds are intended to interrupt and change. Well, I look forward to having discussions with you about uh, the Yazi Martinez suit and how, how what, what progress we're seeing in ways in which the department can assist in that. Um, I'm also, you know, concerned about the learning loss. So all of our students who were already behind is simply increased. We also have uh, a thousand teacher uh, um, shortfall. 
respite. And we know that we need to have our students catch up. We know we need to put those additional resources there. But I mean, the truth is teachers are already overworked and underpaid. Um, so are there ways in which you see across the country that we can um, address learning loss in ways that don't add unmanageable work and unmanageable burdens on our teachers? Like, you know, when we met with Teachers of the Year and other amazing teachers from New Mexico in my office, they pointed out that they'd love to see you know, tutoring, interventionists, where we're bringing in additional resources rather than asking the stressed and dedicated, dedicated teachers to do even more, right, than that to do, go beyond. And they've already gone beyond um, during this pandemic. So what are your thoughts and what are some of the examples you've seen across the country? You just listed some of the examples of tutoring programs. It's a whole community approach and we're seeing best practices of communities coming together to address the overarching needs that our students have. And it's not just the classroom teacher that will address the learning loss needs. It's a whole school, whole community, whole neighborhood approach and the funds are, we're seeing being used in that way. Thank you. Thank you. My time has expired. I yield back. All right. Thank you. Um, I now recognize Ms. Miller Mix for five minutes of questioning, please. Uh, thank you, Chair Salong. I uh, thank our witnesses for their testimony and the uh, comments of the other members. Uh, as a physician and a former director of the Iowa Department of Public Health, uh, certainly we want to keep kids uh, safe in school, children safe in school, teachers and all those who work within the school system. But it, we also know the tremendously detrimental effects of how we've responded to the uh, pandemic in closing schools. Uh, we know that there has been a loss of learning and that's especially affected our minority and low income populations. Uh, it's affected rural areas where there may not have been access uh, to broadband in order to do uh, virtual learning. Um, but we also know that it's had a very deleterious effect to uh, the mental health of children. Uh, and this also includes the masking. Uh, and I know it's been mentioned by other members, uh, but you know I, I think it uh, bears witness that uh, the American Academy of or, uh, American Journal of Pediatrics had published last August that transmission rates in children were very low to minuscule, a little bit different with the Delta variant, um, however. Uh, but we know that in other countries, uh, other uh, European countries, Scandinavian countries, UK, uh, that they are not requiring masking of children in the elementary levels, nor um, uh, under age um, 11, and certainly not in kindergarten. And I think to, uh, if you watch how children wear masks, um, that uh, they probably are contaminating uh, themselves and their mask if in fact they're infected uh, than if they were wearing no mask at all. Uh, and uh, better hand washing might be a, a mitigation strategy that would be extraordinarily helpful. Having said that, however, uh, one of the things that I found as director of public health is when we talk about evidence-based programs and, um, and uh, Under Secretary Martin, you had mentioned several um, critical evidence-based uh, investments and programs uh, in your written testimony. And I'm just going to list several of them. One is the Connecticut uh, Learner Engagement and Attendance Program, LEAP. Um, and you talked about the initiative and that LEAP will support enrollment and work with families to transition back to school. You also mentioned New Mexico's Public Education Department. Um, you also mentioned uh, Detroit uh, Parent Teacher Home Project and that uh, teachers have uh, conducted uh, 5,567 such visits. Um, I have the same issue with this that I had when I was director of the Department of Public Health and as a physician. Uh, an evidence-based program isn't uh, evidence-based because there is one study or one article that mentions that it's something that may be helpful. What is lacking are outcomes. So uh, making visits or having people have access or having uh, a program available doesn't have any outcome results for us, whether that's an improvement in mental health, whether that's a decrease in visits to a mental health provider, whether that's a decrease in disruptive behavior within the classroom. So in any of the programs that you listed in your written testimony, do we have any outcome data for any of those? And are you requiring outcome data? And if so, what is the outcome data? Thank you. Thank you for lifting up some of the programs that are being implemented. And as the funds are going out as quickly as possible so that we can get to the recoveries that are intended by these dollars. The outcomes are coming in as the work is being implemented. 
and understanding the specifics around the programs people are using. Some of them are programs that have been used at a smaller scale. So teacher visits, for example, I forgot what state, but the one that you just mentioned is something that we do have evidence. I can give you some examples of evidence of that, but wasn't done at scale. Now that we have investment to do some of the best practices or promising practices that may have been done at a smaller scale before there was this large investment, now we're able to take these to scale and replicate them and collect evidence as we go about doing that. So would you be willing to share with this committee in, uh, in a timely fashion, meaning you know not late next year, but hopefully by the end of the year or by the end of January, what outcome measures you have for the programs that are listed in your document so that we know what outcomes are being anticipated. And then when you, ex when you expect to have those outcome uh, measurements available to you so that as we look at funding, we can address whether or not we're funding programs that are successful and have true outcomes or whether it's an outcome that is just a, a number of visits or a number of children reached. I think it's important to have those metrics so that we can uh, make accurate uh, appropriations of funds to programs that are successful, especially in our minority communities. I couldn't agree with you more. And yes, I do commit to following up with you and working with you on that. Outcomes matter as much as programs. How are they actually impacting the children that they're intended to serve is critical. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair, and I uh, yield back my time. All right, thank you very much. Um, I now recognize Ms. Hayes. Ms. Hayes, you have five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Congress has made significant investments in K-12 schools through the CARES Act and the American Rescue Plan to help them address and recover from this pandemic. There was no question about the absolute need for these funds. Chronic disinvestment in education had already burdened our system before COVID-19, and then districts were forced to transition to virtual learning and take measures to ensure student and teacher safety and faculty safety. I also strongly agree with my colleagues that we must ensure that we remain good stewards of taxpayer dollars. As a member of Congress, we have a duty to make sure that funds are appropriate, that funds we appropriate are used appropriately, and that we understand areas of improvement in future legislation. As a teacher, I was thrilled to see these significant investments uh, so in things that I had championed my entire career, things that I know educators and school districts need, things that I know had been chronically underfunded for years. So I have a particular interest in making sure that these funds are not misused so that that could then be used as an excuse against future investments. Again, uh, before I start my questions, I just wanna thank teachers everywhere who took on the Herculean task of ensuring that our students return, return to school safely and had a welcoming environment. So my question is for you, Ms. Martins. You talked a lot about the transparency portal and I have a series of questions and I understand you may not have the answers to all of them. So if you could just follow up um, and I, I trust that the department follows up as soon as they have the information available. Um, in the last administration, it took me sometimes 15 to 20 months to get a response on things. And I, I just take it in, in good faith that that was the earliest they could get the information to me. So I don't think that anyone is looking to hide any information. But what safeguards or rail safeguards are used to prevent the misuse of education stabilization funds? And have you identified any states or localities where these funds have been misused or have been subject to fraud? Uh, and what percentage of overall funds that have been dispersed can be identified as having been misused or misappropriated? Thank you for that very specific question. That's about the oversight and use of these funds because we understand a historic investment wants to, we wanna see the outcomes that are, that are intended. And as you mentioned, being a teacher, you know how important this is. I can get, I can have staff get back to you on the specifics percentages. We're engaged in ongoing monitoring and the ongoing monitoring is sometimes focused and targeted. When we hear an example of a misuse, we will go in and better understand what's happening. And then there's comprehensive monitoring of full programmatic decisions that are happening. And then there's some more consolidated monitoring that we're doing, and that's cross programs, cross states. And so those are some levels that we're doing. As you mentioned, the Education Stabilization Fund Transparency Portal is intended to provide clarity and transparency because the importance of these dollars can't be understated in the monitoring and following up is critical and we're happy to follow up with you on the very specific questions and important questions you've just asked. Absolutely, thank you. There was an, an, uh, an incidence of misuse in my own state that was identified promptly by the local leaders 
and action has been taken. Um, but I just feel just incredibly invested in making sure that we are good stewards over this money because these are historic investments that are long overdue. And I do not want misuse, as I stated, to um, be a barrier for future investments. Um, my next question is about ESSER funds. Uh, local education agencies were required to um, report on funds in six broad categories, including purchasing technology, addressing the unique needs of vulnerable student populations, mental health services, sanitation, summer, after school or supplemental learning, and other. According to ProPublica, just over half, as what, half of what has been expended has been categorized as other. Does the department plan on making uh, public more granular data and information on how these funds, specifically those categorized as, uh, as other, have been used? And how can the department help to improve LEA transparency and good governance when it, become, when it comes to spending relief dollars? Yes, thanks for pointing that out. That's very important. It's part of why we have the transparency portal so that, that uh, the dollars are very clear on how they're being spent in each of those categories and more granular level. We're regularly updating as Education Stabilization Fund portal and can get more granular about the category of other as you recommended. I think that that will be very important because again, it cannot be overstated. These funds have been long overdue. For many districts, these massive investments just brought them back to zero because they had been disinvested for decades. So we have to get this right and we have to make sure that this money is used in the way in which it was intended. Uh, that's all I have, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you, thank you. Um, and now give, recognize Mr. Grothman for five minutes of questions, please. Sure, a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, I'm kind of concerned that this program is a little loosey-goosey. Uh, in Wisconsin, $3 billion were allocated so far, 650 million has been spent. So I don't know if that was the intent. I don't know if that was common for other states around the country, but I'd like to have the panelists uh, comment on that, what you expect to do with the money. Is this typical around the country? I think that was... I can, I can begin and if my colleague wants to continue, I'm happy to do that as well. The dollars, uh, the the ability to spend the funds, they haven't, states and districts have until September 30th, 2024 to spend the dollars. And that was very intentional in the way that you all put the funding together. The initial funding that went out, the S or one dollars, um, they have till September 30th, 2022. And what happens is you're making very strong plans for first addressing the physical, physical needs and the campuses making them safe. And some of the expenditures that we see happen right away is what allowed us to have 99.2% of our schools open across the country. As of funds, the next um, amount of funding, schools and districts have till September 30th, 2023, and then the final amount is till 2024. So we're seeing a, a thoughtful, engaged approach to how to spend the dollars. And remember, we've also baked in the requirement that there's stakeholder involvement and stakeholder engagement in developing the plans for spending those dollars. I'd be happy to it looks to me like we spent about 20, 22 percent of what's out there. You don't feel that's a sign that it was kind of wildly overfunded in the first place. That that's what you would expect at this point. Specifically, uh, the, the the overall ESSER dollars that have gone out, the first pot of money that was available to obligate through September thirtieth, twenty twenty two, eighty one percent of those dollars have been expended. And we know districts and LEAs are working on, and state agencies are working on the comprehensive plans over time. We know the dollars were needed in these, in these uh, areas around the safety mitigations, social, emotional, mental health needs, and then learning loss. And some of the learning loss dollars um, and social, emotional needs are being expended on staff. And when you expend and allocate dollars on staffing, the dollars are not spent immediately upon allocating them. It's over time and over a school year and over the next three years, those dollars will be spent. It's not, it's about recovering, but it's about long-term sustainable investment. And when you put staffing into it, the rollout of the spending of those dollars does take time. Okay, seems kind of loose to me, but we have another question. Um, while the effects of COVID-19 may result in permanent closure, of some college and universities, a lot of these at any given time, a lot of schools are struggling financially prior to the pandemic uh, to a certain extent for demographic reasons or, or just they've always been in trouble. 
Uh, according to federal data compiled by the Hecking Report, more than 500 institutions show signs of problems prior to 2020, and more than 50 institutions have closed or merged in the last five years. According to the, Depart uh, the Department of Education's Inspector General, several funds drew down their fund just days before their closure. So in other words, just to pay some bills on the way out the door, not to keep things open. Um, I don't believe that was Congress's intent. Uh, and it didn't extend to even giving this money was not enough to stop the coming consolidation. Rather than waiting for the abrupt closure of institutions, should Congress be more proactive in the future and uh, do a little bit more to prevent the disruption in the kids' college careers? And uh, what can we do to, to anticipate this and make sure that this money doesn't go really just to close an institution and more be targeted towards uh, helping people with their education? Well, thank you so much for the question. I would note in the area of higher education, colleges are now drawing down funds at a rate of close to a billion dollars uh, a week. Um, and the funds that they have remaining are relatively small compared to the financial losses that they're expected to incur over the coming years. With respect to closed schools specifically, you know, I note that it's not necessarily inappropriate. It's possible that they had eligible expenses um, under the laws passed by Congress, but it is very, very important for us. And we have focused on those closing schools specifically, including new internal controls to frequently monitor the status of schools. We are making sure that schools that are in the process of closing need prior approval in order, in order to draw down funds. We are requiring even closed schools to complete audits to make sure that the funds were spent in accordance with federal law. And the inspector general said that if we do follow through on the steps that we've committed, that would address their concerns. So uh, we are taking that thank very you. seriously. Thank you. Uh, okay, so um, thank you. I, I thank you, Mr. Grobman. I, I understand our witnesses. Um, uh, we're asking for a five minute break at 1215, but right now I see Ms. Manning uh, with us and the last questioner, hopefully, but so we'll continue. We're almost done here. Um, Ms. Manning, please, you have five thank minutes. Uh, thank questions. you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I so appreciate sure. it. And thank, thank you to our witnesses for, for bearing through the next couple minutes. Um, Mr. Kowal, in your written testimony, you noted that many of the colleges which have been successful at creating opportunities for all students, including HBCUs, entered the pandemic with historically low funding, largely due to historical inequities. In my district, North Carolina's sixth congressional district, uh, we're home to three outstanding HBCUs that are using the higher education emergency relief funds to make critical investments in addressing students' hardships due to the pandemic. For example, North Carolina A&T announced a series of major investments, including $250 housing and dining scholarships for students, need and merit-based tuition support, and several programs designed to help students complete their degrees at reduced cost. And Winston-Salem State University has made similar investments in its students, through a series of initiatives, including funding for summer school, free and reduced cost textbooks, and assistance with clearing student debt for the fall 2019 and the spring 2020 semesters. Uh, noting the historical funding challenges that many HBCUs faced prior to the pandemic, can you tell us how the emergency relief funds have particularly supported HBCUs during the pandemic? Thanks so much for your question. And it's really important uh, to the president and the secretary that we honor those colleges that are committed to inclusivity, that are make, working toward equity. And of course, historically black colleges and universities are at the forefront of that. You're absolutely right that the HERF funds uh, provided additional relief um, to those institutions and helped them make investments. Um, Delaware State is another one that has cleared institutional debts that allowed students to re-enroll or if they've already graduated to access their transcript in case they need that to get a job. Those types of investments are really, really important in unlocking opportunity and trying to support those really important institutions. And I'd just like to add that uh, UNCG, another school in my district is using the funds, which is a minority serving institution is using the funds similarly. Um, and they did find that there were a significant number of students that when the pandemic hit, um, they couldn't afford food, they didn't have any place to live, 
Um, they certainly were unable to bear many of the normal costs of life. And so there was great appreciation that there were these kinds of funds to use. Um, Deputy Secretary uh, Martin, many students have experienced significant trauma. As we've heard over and over from some of our members, um, trauma as a, as a result of the pandemic, um, uh, as a result of staying home and having their learning disrupted, and especially students in economically distressed communities, which have been disproportionately impacted. And of course, research shows that trauma significantly impacts academic success. And I hear it from people in my district, frankly, from all economic backgrounds. Um, according to a 2019 GAO, GAO study, schools that adopt a trauma-sensitive approach report many positive outcomes, including improvements in school climate and better relationships between and among teachers. And in North Carolina, addressing the social and emotional health and well-being of children has been one of my top priorities for the use of the American Rescue Plan Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief, the ESSER funds. This funding is specifically being used to expand an existing model that provides elementary schools with access to healthcare professionals via telehealth technologies. And early indications have shown that this telehealth option reduces barriers to care for students, resulting in reduced chronic absenteeism, improved health outcomes for children, and a decrease in health-related costs for parents and caregivers. Can you tell us more about how states and school districts are using the ESSER funds to implement trauma-informed practices and support students' social and emotional needs? Thank you for talking about one of the most important parts of the use recovery that you've all intended from the start, that the state plans that are being turned in include specific plans for addressing social, emotional, mental health needs. And just as recently, um, looking at what we have, 879 of the LEAs in 42 states have, uh, have $20.9 million in the subgrant funds to provide mental health supports and services. And you just highlighted a great example of the wise actions that localities are coming up with. For example, working with the mental health professionals, the dollars are intended for those local decisions around the priority that matters around mental health services. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I yield back. All right. So I've been informed that there will be um, additional members to ask questions. So we'll go to Mr. Good. Uh, and after Mr. Good, we'll take a five minute break. Mr. Good, you have five minutes, please. Thank you so much, uh, Chairman. And thank you to our witnesses and everyone else involved with the hearing. Uh, throughout the spring, uh, the Biden administration and Democrats in Congress said that schools couldn't reopen without passage of the American Rescue Plan. And yet, here we are a quarter of the way through the school year with most schools open, almost all the rescue plans core K-12 education funding has not been touched. In fact, only 2% of the $111 billion that was awarded in COVID relief funding has been used for its intended purpose to help elementary and secondary schools. In addition, the Department of Education reported on, as of October 31 that of our 11,000 school districts, 99% are fully open for in-person instruction. Only 87 school districts in the country are still stuck in the hybrid with just one school district being reported as fully remote. I realize that you were not here in the spring, Secretary Martin, but was the Biden administration and their allies and uh, Democrat allies in Congress, were they deliberately lying when they claimed that schools couldn't reopen without the American Rescue Plan funds, or did they simply not know what they were talking about? Specifically speaking about the path to reopening, which was everybody's goal that school students learn best when they're in person, physically in the brick and mortar buildings on their campuses. And what it would take to reopen state by state, school by school, neighborhood by neighborhood was very different. Each community had different needs. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, my time is short. I'm, I'm gonna stop you there. So we were told that we couldn't reopen without all the hundreds of billions of dollars that were allocated. And yet we've reopened anyway, and that money has not been sent. Um, since schools have reopened without the money being spent, how will future funding decisions be made regarding schools and states that do or don't stay open? God forbid that we got people trying to close the schools again, or they do or don't have vaccine mandates, or they do or don't require masks to be worn. Will funds be withheld from school districts or states in any of these situations? Well, or any we of these bases? 
Yes, sir. Understanding the open path to reopening started with the physical safety. It's expending the rest of the dollars on addressing the learning losses, the disparate impacts that students experience, the social, emotional, mental health needs. That's where the rest of the dollars are being implemented now, and districts are making those plans going forward. The goal is not only that we are open, but we want to stay open, implementing the mitigation strategies that we know work. Okay. When Th those thank, are thank, thank you, if I may, uh, we're climbing the time. Yes, when we can all see that American students are falling behind and the COVID shutdowns just made that much worse. And of course, many parents have started to look for alternative education. That's why I've introduced a bill this Congress called the Children Have Opportunities in Classrooms Everywhere Act. It's called the Choice Act, and it would give parents the ability to deposit federal funds into a 529 savings account to follow their students to the public school, private school, or home school of their choice. As we've recently seen in the election results in my home state of Virginia, parents are rightfully demanding choices and input regarding their children's education and my choice act would help in that regard. Now back to another question, given the policies of this administration and given the previously mentioned 98% of COVID related school funds that are unspent, will prioritizing illegal immigrants be part of that funding for how those funds are eventually spent? The path forward is implementing the dollars as they were intended. And that's our job is to make sure we understand the state plans reflect the requirements as written into this law. If I may interject, my concern arises because back on June 17 of 2020, the outstanding former Secretary DeVos published a rule clarifying the definition of student to those eligible for student aid under Title IV of the Higher Education Act and restricting international students and non-citizens from receiving assistance under the Higher Education Emergency Relief Fund or HERF. However, on May 24, or excuse me, May 14 of this year, your department published a rule updating guidance for the student portion of HERF funds under the CARES Act and the COVID Supplemental Appropriations Bill to remove the restriction and allow illegal immigrants, undocumented students, asylum seekers, and others previously ineligible to receive these grants. Uh, this is not surprising given this administration's interest in redistributing up to $450,000 to illegal immigrant families. Do you think that illegal immigrants should have the same eligibility for these precious education funding as needed American, needy American families do? Mr. Good, I'm, I'm happy to take a crack at that question since it's in the area of higher education. It is true that uh, this administration published a regulation clarifying that all students are eligible for financial support under the HERF funds for those emergency scholarships. We believe that's consistent with the statute and it makes students eligible regardless of whether or not they've included a FAFSA and that would include- Well, my time has uh, expired, I, I shall of, yield back, but here we go again, putting Americans last and here we got illegal immigrants being put yeah. ahead of america thank you Mr. thank Good. you so much thank you uh, at this time um, the chair is going to declare a five minute recess uh we'll be back at uh wow it's now 12 22 we'll be back at 12 27 uh thank you
recognize uh, Mr. Bowman. Sir, you have five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my first question goes to Ms. Martin. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, like you, I'm a former educator, and so I know how important these emergency funds have been in helping schools support their students during the pandemic. When schools are equipped to meet the needs of the whole child, they see not only better academic outcomes for students, but also better mental health, which is so, so important. Physical health and economic outcomes for students, families, and the entire community. This is why I founded a public community school in the Bronx and why I'm a huge advocate of expanding the full service community schools model to as many neighborhoods as possible. Earlier this year, the department released a helpful uh, FAQ for how states and school districts could use funding to adopt a full service community school model to better meet the needs of the whole child. For many schools, the community school model is brand new, so technical assistance is critical for getting started successfully. Based on the technical assistance ED has provided on this thus far, what have some of the biggest hurdles been for schools trying to adopt the community school model for the first time during COVID? Uh, thank you for uh, bring, lifting up a really important model, the community schools approach and the technical assistance that we've provided. Specifically, uh, some of the impediments, I, I couldn't speak to what those exact are community by community, but what I know is the reason why we provided the technical assistance as well as collaboration from districts that are doing it well, lifting up best models, is so that people can learn from each other. With this historic investment, schools and communities that are implementing these kinds of practices that we've known for a long time work, we need to be able to share those. That's why we have programs like uh, webinars and clearing houses and doing convenings where people can actually learn from one another. And so I'd be happy to work with you more to understand some of the best practices and any impediments that you may be hearing from the field. That's our job is to help people understand how to best use in the way intended. Absolutely, definitely uh, looking forward to working more together on this issue. Uh, I wanna drill down a little bit on mental health and social emotional learning. Uh, one of the most important aspects of supporting the whole child, as you know, is focusing on mental health. But we also know that far too many schools do not have enough counselors, social workers, and mental health professionals to support their students' social emotional needs when we are in the midst of a global pandemic. Even prior to COVID, uh, this was needed and schools uh, did not have the resources or the perspective, in my opinion. This is why I co-led the Counseling Not Criminalization in Schools Act with Congresswoman Presley and Omar I, was, I am also pleased to see that the department put out a new resource in October for supporting mental health during COVID to emphasize how COVID relief could be used to hire more high quality trauma-informed staff. Uh, Ms. Martin, are you finding that schools and districts are choosing to use uh, ESSER funds to hire more mental health staff and implement social emotional learning programs? How many more school-based mental health staff have been hired as a result of COVID relief? And let me just add, uh, in New York City, it's been a real struggle to get money out the door into the hands of districts and schools uh, to hire personnel in these areas. That's what I'm seeing in New York City. I'm wondering if you're seeing it in, in different places across the country. You're exactly right that the mental health needs are a very important and clear path forward for recovery and what recovery really will look like. And that, we're, that was why it's part of the plans. The plans that are being submitted must require or require that they put in what they're planning to do to address student social, emotional, and mental health needs. And specifically, we are seeing districts working with uh, hiring more mental health professionals. For example, in New York, they hired 500 social workers, ensuring each school has at least one school-based social worker and one mental health professional, and they've already hired 90% of them. That's one example. We're seeing the funds being meant being used as intended. When they turn in their state plans, if there is not a plan for mental health needs, that plan is continue to be worked on until it is addressed. It must be addressed because frankly, our students need it. Awesome, thank you so much. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Bowman. Um, I, Mr. Keller, um, you have five minutes for questioning, please. I think you need to unmute, Mr. Keller. Yeah, I had to unmute and get my mask off and everything okay. else. So. Th thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Qual, in July, the Wall Street Journal published a report about many students' challenges after graduating from elite institutions with graduate degrees in fine arts programs. 
Recent film program graduates of Columbia University who took out federal student loans had a median debt of $181,000. Yet two years after earning their master's degrees, half of the borrowers were making less than $30,000 a year. Further, the Wall Street Journal published another story of a highly regarded private institution that knowingly encouraged parents to take out plus loans that they knew they could not afford. These types of reports underscore the need for Congress to bring accountability to higher education based on student outcomes. Unfortunately, many have suggested that accountability measures should be focused exclusively on the proprietary sector. Yet the Wall Street Journal story highlights that the problem is much broader and that any solution should be applied evenly across all sectors of higher education. So Mr. Qual, do you think that all students in all sectors should be protected from this type of behavior, including those at elite institutions? Thank you for the question, Mr. Keller. I think it is fair to say that there are challenges with student loan affordability um, at all types of colleges uh, for a lot of reasons that we should not, uh, we need to work very hard to make sure that student loans are a good investment and a path to upward mobility and not something that pulls people down. Um, and that no college and no program should routinely leave students with debts they can't afford to repay. Uh, that said, historically, the biggest problems that we have seen have been in the for-profit sector. Um, and that's something I think we all need to be aware of as we're thinking about how we address this problem. I, I, I'll, just, I, I'll just jump in there. I think there's problems all across. It, it shouldn't matter. Uh, and, and, and with that, uh, I guess I'll, I'll get to my ne uh, next question, Mr. Qual. It was about five months ago, uh, we had the secretary uh, here at a hearing uh, and Secretary Cordona basically came to the same conclusion that I believe, but he, he actually said it to the committee that he believes that all institutions should be treated the same regardless of their filing status, whether or not for profit or, or, or public, my question is that was five months ago. Has, has the secretary, secretary talked to you about any, any plan to implement how we measure institutions and bring them all to the same playing field? Well, thanks for the question. I talk, of course, to the secretary very regularly. I don't want to get into the details of those conversations, um, but I know that he shares um, the view that you and I have that um, all institutions should serve students and taxpayers well and that no institution should routinely leave students with unaffordable debts. Okay, okay so, so my question is on measuring outcomes. Have you start, has he talked to you? I mean, I, I know we were here, it was five months ago. Is there any plan to get started on, on making sure that everybody's measured the same way? It's very, very important to us to make sure that colleges and universities are routinely helping students graduate and then move on, whether it's to further education or directly into a career. No, but, but the measure, no, no, I'll take my time back. My question is, we agreed that everybody should be measured under the same metrics. Right. What is the plan or has a plan been started or is there a timetable when we can expect to see the work on a plan that will be measuring the outcomes for students based upon the student and, and making sure that we measure every educational institution the same way? Well, we are beginning a rulemaking on institutional eligibility issues uh, early next year. And we'll be taking public comment and working with uh, colleges from all sectors and all types of colleges and universities, including the for-profit <coughs> sector, try to design a new set of rules around institutional eligibility, including potentially student outcomes. Well, it should be based on that. On October 8th, the department announced a new enforcement unit at FSA to ensure that schools adhere to the federal student aid program rules and deliver quality education to their students. If the reporting by the Wall Street Journal is correct, it appears these actions warrant further investigation. Can you confirm that this new enforcement unit will look into all schools, public, private, and for-profit alike, who are alleged to have misled their students and their parents? Well, I would say I think we're very fortunate to have Rich Cordray um, leading federal student aid, and he is going to put uh, students and taxpayers first. And I know his vision for that unit is going to be looking wherever the problems are, not limited to any one sector. Okay, I, I just, I just want to make sure that the commitment we got from the, or, or the, the recognition from the secretary that everybody should be measured the same 
we, we take action on Thank that you. sooner sooner rather than later because it's that important to our students. Our, our Thank students you. deserve that. Thank and, you, Mr. Keller. And, Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, Mr. Jones, uh, you're now recognized for five minutes of questioning, please. Mr. Jones, I think you need to unmute. All right. Um, Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. <laughs> Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to Chairwoman Wilson for convening this important hearing. Of course, thank you to Undersecretary Kowal and Deputy Secretary Martin uh, for your commitment to helping schools reopen safely and address learning loss. A quality education is a right, not a privilege. It shouldn't be based on the zip code of a family or based on how much money that family has in its bank account. The American Rescue Plan, made critical investments in our nation's K through 12 education system. Uh, and it's the education department's responsibility to ensure that these funds have the effect that the House Education and Labor Committee intended. Funds must be spent properly and in accordance with the statutory requirements in the American Rescue Plan. That's why we're here today. As a proud product of the East Ramapo Central School District in Rockland County, New York, which was so overwhelmed and under-resourced in January of this year that it was talking about cutting 32 teaching and other staff positions mid-year in the midst of a pandemic. Getting this right is personal to me. I was proud to deliver over $240 million for K through 12 public schools in New York's 17th district through the American Rescue Plan, including $150 million for the East Ramapo School District. But again, this money will only be effective if properly invested. And my office has worked to impose oversight and community input through the formation of an advisory task force, which worked to develop recommendations for school district staff on how to best use this historic funding. Oversight from the State Department of Education in New York will further strengthen our efforts to ensure that this funding is used as effectively as possible. Anticipating potential abuses, my colleagues and I wrote a provision in the American Rescue Plan that requires all $9.4 billion in K-12 through funding that New York State receives go to public schools, and it mandates that the distribution of those funds be overseen by the Department of Education. Uh, Under Secretary Kowal, during the previous administration, certain schools were eligible for and took advantage of two sources of funding administered through the CARES Act specifically the Education Stabilization Fund and the Small Business Administration's Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, to prevent this, Congress prohibited schools from participating in both ESF and PPP at the same time, and it placed additional restrictions on the use of ESF money by for-profit schools. How is the department monitoring the allocation of funds to ensure that schools are not able to access multiple sources of funding in violation of the law? Well, thank you for that question, Mr. Jones. And we are working very hard to make sure that institutions are eligible um, for whatever funds that they draw down. That includes close collaboration um, with our colleagues across the department and the government. And we have um, imposed audit requirements on additional for-profit colleges that unlike their nonprofit peers, were not subject to federal auditing requirements before. And we've required signatures by executives and principal owners of for-profit colleges to ensure that they're familiar with all the terms and conditions of accepting her funds. And of course, that includes the eligibility uh, that you mentioned. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Secretary, do you have anything to add? No, I appreciate the, uh, the level of sincerity that, that you understand how important it is that these funds are spent in the way intended. That's why we have our um, the Department of Education Stabilization Fund Transparency Portal. That's around clarity and transparency. And we're providing the detailed annual reporting that at the end of each federal fiscal year, that you'll be able to see how those funds are being allocated in the way that they were intended and in following the, intent, the law um, as written, including student social emotional needs, mental health needs, addressing learning loss, and any of the physical things that were needed to change in our schools so that we could safely reopen. The oversight of those dollars and the funds matter to us, monitoring those on an ongoing basis and then providing clear annual reports 
through a, a portal that has a, the transparency that's required. Thank you. Uh, finally, what information sharing and cooperation has occurred between the department, the Small Business Administration, and other agencies to ensure compliance? Well, I would want to give you a um, more complete answer, so perhaps we can follow up with that. But again, um, both the auditors and the executives and owners of for-profit colleges are fully aware of federal requirements. Um, and we've taken steps to make sure that they are enforcing all of the rules, including the, um, the overlap with the PPP loans that you mentioned. Thank you. Thank you. I look forward to that additional information. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, uh, Mr. Jones. Uh, Ms. McLean, um, yeah, Ms. McLean, you have uh, five minutes of questioning, please. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And thank you to all of our witnesses today. Um, obviously, education is extremely important uh, to the future of our of our country and our progress. And um, I appreciate your time today. Ms. Martin, my first question is for you is school districts have until if I'm correct, September of 2024, to use their ERSA funds for new HVAC systems and, and other pandemic related means. Um, so first of all, is that the correct time, September of 24? Yeah, that's the correct time for the third pot of money for the ARP ESSER funds. Okay. The, the first timeline was expired September 30th, 2022. Then the next pot of money was September 2023. Right. And then Some of the, yeah. Thank you. Some of the concerns or issues that I'm hearing from not only school systems um, in, in my district, but also in the surrounding Metro Detroit um, districts is they have this pot of money and they're extremely grateful because they can use this pot of money for, for clearly infra infrastructure needs that, that they need to complete to make their school system safer and um, and better for, for learning and whatnot. The issue comes down to this. We are having some supply chain issues and some workforce shortages. Their concern to me is what, uh, um, uh, what happens if because of the supply chain issues and the workforce shortages, if we can't get all of those projects completed, are we gonna lose those funds? Can we talk about perhaps I mean, these are funds that we're actually using for good projects, but because of the other situations that we're in, is there anything we can do or have you thought about any extensions to these timelines so we don't just hurry up and use the money for something so we use it and we actually use it for proper educational tools? Does that make sense? Thank you. Yes, that makes okay. perfect sense. And we, that is something that we're hearing, not just from your area. I okay. understand that. So go back to the original intent of these dollars, which is our job to, to implement and follow the law as we're using the, the funds and approving the plans. And so we have to follow the law at this point. There is no extension on the timelines, but understanding what you're saying, that something that maybe is going to be discussed in the future, but I'm not aware of those discussions at this point. Will you be opposed the, to that? Well, the focus is on safely reopening the schools and knowing that schools might need things like infrastructure. The dollars can be used for infrastructure. So I'd like to know more about the particular issues. Our staff has worked very closely state by state with any of the issues around implementation and compliance that they're facing. And we will always continue to do that as work closely with states on what so they're you're facing. Open. You're open to it. I, I I mean, I'm like just concerned. <laughs> yes, I'm concerned for these the schools. Um, because they're actually trying to do the right thing. So, okay, let me switch. Um, my second question is, is for Mr. Qual. Inflation has reached, obviously, a highest point in 30 years, and Americans seem to be paying more for everything. Um, on the higher education front, tuition over the past 30 years has increased over 130%. Um, and yet we're giving more and more money in federal aid to colleges and universities that are still raising their prices. So my, my question for you is, what are you and the administration going to do to stop the rising costs of tuition? Thank you for the question. Um, first and foremost, um, the single biggest reason for rising tuitions at public colleges and universities, which enroll three quarters of I'm students. I'm talking about public and private, so let's not segregate because, I mean, the college is the college. You're, fair enough. 
Um, but the biggest factor at public colleges, which is where three quarters of students are, has been state budget cuts over time. And so that is one reason why the bipartisan action to invest in colleges during this recession and prevent tuition spikes will hopefully help us avoid a repeat of past experiences. I think there are other things that we can do to help colleges and universities help students earn college degrees as quickly as possible. And one important part of the- So hang on one second. Did I, I wanna make sure I understand you. Shorten, you know, where the average student takes four and a half, maybe five years, try to get them to graduate on time. So run, run our college programs more um, efficiently. Is that what you're saying? Graduating on time is, is one important factor. <laughs> um, we, all, we also want uh, to invest in things that help students complete because as, as you know, our national completion rate is only about 60% and that will make investments in college. We can bring down the cost per graduate by helping many more students complete. Thank you. Thank you all. And um, I'm out of time, so I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. McLean. Uh, Mr. Desaunier, sir, you have five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Excellent French pronunciation. Um, I have two questions, uh, and I'll give them both to you and let, let you uh, both decide uh, who should best answer them. One of is sort of a more macro one, and one is specific to the disability community. Um, the, the first question is, I come from a big state, California. Um, the superintendent of public instruction is a friend and constituent, uh, uh, Tony Thurman. I have had meetings with him and with my uh, county superintendent just to make sure that within my district, um, we know we don't want a one size fits all in a big diverse uh, country, but we want these funds to be spent um, as efficiently and appropriately as possible. And then we have hopefully, not hopefully, we we're gonna have this new very significant investment in education, historic one. So my concern is just the infrastructure uh, of providing that oversight from the federal, state, the local level, and um, how we do that in a responsible way, not overprescribe. Uh, sort of the porridge question is right: what is the right temperature, and what can we do either within our districts to help your department to work with our state um, education departments and our local departments to have a good conversation about the best practices to get these investments out appropriately and efficiently. And then the second question is specific to the disability community. Um, individual education plans, IEPs, have been very difficult for this community. Um, how do you see us being able to facilitate uh, these funds being spent with the disability and special needs uh, community? So those two questions, um, I'll leave it to you to give us guidance and respond. I, I can begin because anybody who uses a uh, elementary fairy tale reference of the Goldilocks and the porridge example, not, you want to get this just right, not too hot, not too cold, and get it just right in the oversight. It's an incredibly important and serious topic, though I make light of it because you made a literacy reference, but it's very important that the oversight of not just the plans as the plans are coming in, that they address specifically what they're intended to address, the physical health and safety needs, social, emotional, mental health needs, and the learning loss needs, and then that they're designed for students that were most negatively or disparate impacts of the pandemic. And there's a very specific fund specifically for students with disabilities and the nearly 8 million students with disabilities and the $3 billion that were in the AOP funds. There's very clear intention. And so in the way that we implement here at the Department of Education is that follow the law and follow the good, strong intentions that were met, that were designed to meet the needs of kids that were most disproportionately impacted. And the oversight begins with the transparency portal that we've put up. There'll be annual reporting on it, but there's also not waiting for the annual reporting. There's ongoing monitoring, focused and targeted monitoring as we hear of hotspots that might be coming up across the country. That's how I'll answer and I'll let my colleague address that as well. No, he says I did I don't it. have anything to add to that. Thank you. <laughs> if you could maybe help us just for all of us, how can we help within our districts and in our communities? Most of us, all of us, I probably assume, have relationships with our county education departments uh, in our state and our districts. So what's appropriate for us to interact with you, um, appropriate, so that we're all providing as much resources as possible and oversight? You know, well, I, I would, 
Thank you. I would, I, you lifted up the example how you're working with your state superintendent, Tony Thurman. You're working with your county superintendent. You're providing a model of how that could look like. This is a whole of government and whole of community approach that it's not just one silver bullet or one answer around how we're going to recover from this pandemic. It's all of the funds being used in the ways that they're intended and creating the very specific plans for how you're going to work together in communities and I would also point everybody to the multiple resources that this department has published, the mental health resources, the resources for students with disabilities, the webinars that we've been putting on for staffing shortages or ways to address learning loss, or we did a, a program this summer for summer learning. So we're putting clearinghouse type documents out. And if you want to work with us on that, help us with, to put out the, uh, to disseminate the materials that the department has been publishing specifically with the kinds of guidance that we know people are hungry for, that best decisions are made local, but we also know that we can provide good examples that show how to use the funds as intended. That's terrific. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. All right. Thank you. Um, I now recognize Mrs. Miller. Mrs. Miller, you have five minutes, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Deputy Secretary Martin, the Department of Justice issued a memo directing the FBI to investigate parents who show up at school board meetings. Does the Department of Education believe the FBI should be used to intimidate and scare parents out of showing up for the school board meetings? Uh, thank you for that question. Rather than mention or weigh in on what the Department of Justice has done, I can talk about the importance of parents being involved in their child's education and what it looks like. Well, what do you think about the FBI though? Uh, investigating, we now have evidence that the FBI was using counterterrorism tools against parents in response to the DOJ's school board memo. Do you agree with this practice by the DOJ and the FBI? Uh, I'd rather not weigh in on, on what other agencies have done and what they're, what they're choosing to do. That's something that they choose and that's their decision. Okay. Did you or anyone at the Department of Education have conversations with the DOJ, FBI, or the White House while the memo was being written? I am not aware of that, no. So neither you nor anybody at the Department of Education had conversations with the DOJ, FBI, or the White House while the memo was being written. Is that right? You're saying no, they did not. I did not. I can speak to what I know in my experiences that I did not. Okay. So and do you know of anyone in the Department of Education that had conversations with the DOJ, FBI, or the White House? While this memo I was- I not, Thank you. Thank you for the question. I am not aware of that myself. What we know okay. is that it's been a very difficult year for parents around our country. Right. Did you or anyone at the Department of Education have any conversations with the National School Board Association while they were writing their September letter to the DOJ, because we know members of the National School Board Association spoke with the DOJ and the White House office while they were crafting the letter. Were you involved in any of these conversations or was anybody at the Department of Education? I'd be happy to have our staff follow up with you on that because I'm not aware of the specific details of the question that you're asking at this point. Okay. And Deputy Secretary Martin, when Secretary Cardona testified before this committee, I asked him about the department's guidance to school teachers that they could be charged with harassment if they say that there are only two genders, male and female. I asked the secretary how many genders there are and he couldn't answer. Could you please tell me how many genders are there? Well, I'd rather talk about the bigger value around our students being able to learn. And under school. your guidance, under your guidance, you are saying that teachers could be investigated for harassment if they state the biological fact that there's two genders. What's so most important is that. All, are all you campuses. saying? Are you saying that teachers could lose their job over this, but you can't actually say how many genders there are? Uh, we don't make decisions at the local level about teachers. But this is local. Say, so this came from the Department of Education. This is not the, local. If it was local, I assure you, regular Americans, including rank and file Democrats, are furious that the Department of Education is promoting the teacher of teaching of gender identity in schools. It's a made up con concept that's going to have significant implications. Every human is either a male or female. That's a biological fact. 
Thank you. So you still can't say how many genders there are? I can tell you that the department is committed to student safety and all students' right to access education in all of the students. What, about, what the about the teachers that teach biology or genetics and they say that there's two genders, male and female? It, it's Your department's guidance is saying that they could be subject to investigation for harassment. What do you say about that? At the end it's of the day, outrageous. I know that. No, it's hard to come up with a, a an answer that could satisfy parents in our country. Thank you for your questions. Yeah, did you have an answer for that? Because teachers could be losing their jobs over this, over saying that they're stating the biological and genetic fact that there's two genders. It's your department that put this guidance out. You're and making the department vulnerable. And even students perhaps that don't feel safe in the locker rooms or bathrooms, and they go in um, and you know communicate that to uh, perhaps a principal or a teacher, perhaps then they're accused of harassment also. All this right. has really got significant implications. Thank so you. I hope next time you could tell us how many genders there are. Thank you, and I yield back. Yeah, thank you. And now, um, finally, I recognize the distinguished gentle lady from Minnesota, Ms. Omar. You have five minutes for questions, please. Thank you, um, Chairman, and uh, I, I, I just want to um, thank the, the witnesses for their testimonies and uh, Ms. Martin for um, your, your, your ability to stay the course um, while you're, you're faced with um, nonsensical uh, line of, of questioning. Um, in response to the unprecedented challenges caused by COVID-19, Congress provided a historic investment um, in our nation to our nation's educational system, helping schools reopen safely and provide extra support to their students. As of this month, approximately $23 billion of the ESSER funds have been drawn down by states and school districts. According to recent survey from the school Superintendents Association, 75% of district leaders are using um, the American Rescue uh, Plan funding to address lost instructional and extracurricular time by offering robust summer learning and enrichment programs. 66% of district leaders are hiring more counselors, social workers, and reading specialists. And 62% of district leaders are purchasing digital devices and addressing connectivity issues. Ms. Martin, how is the department ensuring these programs address the disproportionate impact of the pandemic um, that, it, that the pandemic has had on underserved student groups? Thank you so much for highlighting some of the wise actions that you just outlined that people are taking to spend the dollars as they were intended. The, the intentions around spending this money in a way that gives schools a chance to reopen and reopen safely and stay open to address the mental health and social emotional needs to address learning loss and to design the plans in ways that ensure that those that were disproportionately impacted get a good chance of recovering and being stronger in terms of us identifying students by name and by need and developing the programs that will help them most significantly. I think the state plans give us the kind of window into the very detailed plan, um, programs, actions, and services that states are coming up with to address the needs that you just outlined. I know specifically um, in, in your state, you had an effort, one of the, some of the ways they were spending the dollars was a roll up your sleeves campaign to connect public health departments to the LEAs to provide the on-site vaccination clinics. That's just one of the health and safety mechanisms because we know kids can't learn if they're not in person or they learn better when they're in person. And so we're seeing these wise plans and actions coming state by state and developed with the local community voices. That was part of the intention of the dollars being spent. Wonderful. Um, and uh, Ms. Martin, the American Rescue Plan also includes an unprecedented eight hundred million dollars to support the specific needs of children and youth experiencing homelessness. State and local um, educational agencies must use these funds to provide homeless students 
and youth with wraparound services to address challenges that have been exasperated by COVID-19. Can you tell us more about how these funds are being used to serve these uh, vulnerable students? Yeah, I'll point people to some of the guidance and supports that the department's putting out as great examples of what local districts and states are putting into their plans. And I think that it's very significant. This is my 32nd year in education. And it's very significant for me to be able to witness the intentions that were put into this, the fact that we put $800 million specifically to students experiencing homelessness. There are districts and states and localities that have come up with good plans to serve students experiencing homelessness, but they haven't been able to scale those. And with this investment that we're making now, we can actually bake in long-term programs, actions, and services to address students who experience homelessness, whether it was because of the pandemic or even before the pandemic. And I think we can continue to lift up the best practices that we're seeing around the country with the dollars that have such specific intention and that the fact that it was designed at the outset to meet those needs says a lot about what we're going to do to meet the needs of our students. Uh, thank you for the thoughtful um, responses. I look forward to us engaging. And uh, Mr. Chairman, before I end, I want to say that our school environments are supposed to be more inclusive uh, in addressing the needs of, of our children. Um, and that's what this com committee should be committed to, the fact that there are people on this committee that are constantly trying to find ways to create environments that are um, hostile for our students is really disheartening. Uh, and I do hope that we go back into the business of trying to make sure that our school environments are welcoming and inclusive for all of our children. And I say that as a mother and someone who represents one of the youngest districts in, in Congress. Uh, with that, I yield back. Uh, Ms. Omar, and I also agree with you as a father of two teachers. I can't agree with you anymore. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Cotton, uh, sir, uh, you have five minutes of questioning, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Deputy Secretary Martin, since this is the first opportunity we've had to speak with you since you assumed your current role, I want to get your thoughts on some of the controversies you experienced in San Diego and how you might see these issues playing out for you at your Department of Education. First, your nomination was opposed by the San Diego chapter of the NAACP, largely because of your perceived opposition to charter schools. The NAACP in San Diego was apparently rightfully concerned about the extensive achievement gaps between white and black students in your city, and were concerned with your participation in some statewide initiatives to limit the growth of charter schools as a mean for, means for providing better educational opportunities to those students. Second, you invited a critical race theory a theorist named Bettina Love to provide professional development to your teachers in San Diego. According to press reports, her presentation included strong elements of critical race theory, uh, greatest hits, if you will, uh, including the idea that white teachers spirit murder, unquote, black students. Mrs. Martin, do you believe, like Mrs. Love taught, that white teachers, in, and I quote, spirit murder black students? And do you believe, as she asserted, that black students' achievements are dependent upon the actions of non-black students? Uh, thank you for your question and pointing out that this is the first time we've had a chance to meet one another, so it's nice to meet you, and thank you for bringing up a couple of questions. And the work that we did in San Diego was critical around addressing the longstanding disparities and the, the achievement outcomes that we saw in San Diego was work that I was dedicated to and committed to, 32 years in education and eight years as superintendent. That was the work that we put in place to address the longstanding disparities and to give students access to the kinds of supports and resources that they needed to achieve. Okay, so by taking away charter schools, you were giving them the uh, the, the assets that they needed. That doesn't make much sense to me, but Deputy Secretary, research shows that 74% of voters supported school choice, including 73% of black voters, 69% of Hispanic voters, and 70% of Democrats. That's not surprising. Americans value choice and low-income families deserve the same freedom to pursue the educational opportunities their wealthy neighbors enjoy. The failures of many public schools to be responsive to families, families shows the need for increased opportunities. And yet, in, in the president's fiscal year 2022 budget proposal, the department proposed eliminating the D.C. Opportunity Scholarship Program. This program has been a lifeline for thousands of low-income students to escape the underperforming schools. In April 2019, this committee held a hearing examining the legacy of Brown versus Board of Education. Virginia Walden Ford, a parent advocate and driving force behind the creation of the DC Choice Program, wrote the committee saying, 
And I quote, the same schools that we fought hard to get into the 1960s after the Brown versus Board of Education decision have become the schools we must diligently find a way to get minority children out of. These schools and programs that our children are now forced to attend are creating environments where our kids cannot get the education they deserve, end quote. Deputy Secretary, why are you proposing to take away the educational freedom that so many parents have fought so hard to achieve? School matters so much for every student. And in my 32 years, I can see the importance of everybody having access to a school that meets their needs. That is critically important. And I can see the difference that public education provides to our students. It's about bringing people together and giving them learning conditions that allow them to live their best life and achieve their academic potential. It's not about dividing one another, but coming together to give schools and students access to the kinds of learning communities and conditions that are best for them. So, Deputy Secretary, I find it interesting that you said you find the, the necessity and the beneficiary, how beneficial it is for public education for students, uh, yet you mentioned nothing about charter schools and school choice. Do you oppose charter schools and school choice? Uh, charter schools are public schools, and the work that I did in San Diego reflects our investment, our commitment to charter schools. We passed some successful local bond measures that invested over $350 million in improving charter school facilities and work closely with our charter school partners to make sure that every student in San Diego De had access. De Deputy Secretary, I hate to interrupt, but then why did the De NAACP resist your nomination to be in that position in San Diego? Because of what they said is ex extensive achievement gaps between white and black students in your city, and they were concerned with participation in some statewide initiatives to limit the growth of charter schools. Why, why did the NAACP think that you're limiting charter schools? I would be happy to follow up with you with a more extensive conversation on the details of the achievement as recognized by the Learning Policy Institute, how we closed achievement gaps for black and brown students and were distinguished as a positive outlier district that was able to prove results for students of color. And I could get into more detail about the work we did specifically with charter schools and the local concerns. I'm happy to have a further um, follow-up questions if you'd like to submit those. Thank you. All right, Deputy Secretary, I'm out of time with that, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the elevation to speaker also, Mr. Cothern. Um, Mr. Still, um, you have five minutes of questioning, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I have a question to Deputy Secretary Martin. I understand that in many states, emergency assistance to non-public schools funds are helping private schools meet the extraordinary needs of students caused by the pandemic. I am also told that there are a few states like California and Maryland that have still not delivered any service to under this program to the students. What is the department doing to ensure that those states comply with the law and begin delivering services to non-public students? And what are you doing to ensure as many non-public education students as possible are receiving emergency relief services? Thank you for the question. It's our job to implement the law as it was designed and written. And as of, I believe it was as of Wednesday, at least 27 of the plans will be approved and we'll continue to work with all of the remaining states if their plans aren't in or working with them on what they need to do to get their plans finished. Okay, so they're gonna get it soon or you are actually um, asking that, that these states that what they are doing. We're in active conversation with each state. If their plan has already come in and we're still in dialogue with them or actively working with each state um, as, as we see their plans come in and make sure that we're continuing to work with any of the remaining states that do not have plans. Thank you. Under the American Rescue Plan, Congress limited eligibility to private schools with a quote, significant unquote percentage of low income students the department defined term significant to mean 40% of the children in a non-public school. However, Hawaii submitted an application that defined the low income threshold at 47.5%, not 40%, which cut off services to private school students who need them. At the same time, you have pushed back on some states who have sought to reduce the threshold in order to provide services to a greater number of low-income private school students. Why did you approve Hawaii's application, which further limits 
access to services for non-public schools? Thank you for your question. This is important that we're implementing as it was written and as expected. And you talked about specifically the significant percentage of 14 plans that adopted the 40% threshold of significant percentage of students from low income backgrounds. And then there were 13 plans that have approved the alternative threshold. And the approved alternative threshold so far has ranged between 20 and 47%. But we're gonna to continue to work with any of the remaining states to, to problem solve this. Okay. So next one is the rollout of the non-public education provision was rocky and maybe or slow in a handful of states where their own state legislature, legislatures or procurement rules held up the process. What kind of flexibility can be offered in these states to ensure that the state can fully meet needs of students in non-public schools and what is the department doing to ensure the money is used to address the needs of non-public school community within the confines of the statute? And that, that is our role, is to make sure that we're meeting the needs of non-public schools and stay in compliance with the statute. And when we're hearing some um, different kinds of rollouts where the timelines may not have been wet, we're working with those states to ensure that these dollars get to the students as intended by the statute. And as we learn about states where that may have been stopped or there the timelines may have been compromised. We're going to work with them to ensure that we're implementing with fidelity to the intent of this of the um, statute. Okay, Mr. Cha Chairman, do I still have more time? Okay, because I have about the charter school question. Okay. If I have, we have forty five seconds, uh, Mr. Still. Then you know what? I'm going to submit this uh, that last question regarding charter school question. Then. All right. Yes. Thank you. Uh, you yield back? Thank you. I yield back. I yield okay. back. All right. Thank you, Mrs. Steele. Thank you, everyone. Uh, uh, I remind my colleagues that pursuant to committee practice, materials for submission for the hearing record must be submitted to the committee clerk within 14 days following the last day of the hearing. So by close of business on December 1st, preferably in Microsoft Word format. The materials submitted must address the subject matter of the hearing. Only a member of the committee or an invited witness may submit materials for inclusion in the hearing record. Documents are limited to 50 pages each. Documents longer than 50 pages will be incorporated into the record via an internet link that you must provide to the committee clerk within the required time frame. But please recognize that in the future, the link may no longer work. Pursuant to house rules and regulations, items for the record should be submitted to the clerk electronically by emailing transmissions to edandlabor.hearings at mail.house.gov. That's uh, edandlabor.hearings at mail.house.gov. Um, again, I want to thank our witnesses for partic their participation today. Members of the committee may have some additional questions for you, and we ask the witnesses to please respond to those questions in writing. The hearing record will be held open for 14 days in order to receive those responses. I remind my colleagues that pursuant to committee practice witness questions for the hearing record must be submitted to the majority committee staff or committee clerk within seven days. The questions must submitted must address the subject matter of the hearing. I now recognize um, the uh, chairwoman Wilson for a closing statement. Before I, oh, shucks. <laughs> Before I close. Uh, I yeah. Please proceed. Please I have proceed. a letter from the Association of Public and Land Grant in Universities about the importance of her funds. And I would like to submit it for the record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you for hosting this important hearing. And I want to thank our amazing witnesses. You were absolutely great. Your leadership and testimonies helped America understand what we do on the Education Committee and what happens in the Department of Education. Thank you.
so much for being with us today. Today, we reflected on the historic investments Congress and President Biden delivered to institutions of higher education through three COVID relief packages, including the American Rescue Plan. It's clear that the relief we provided has been critical to helping both institutions and students weather this pandemic. It is crucial that we continue to conduct strong oversight to ensure that institutions are using these funds responsibly to support their students, faculty, and staff. And as our witnesses testify, the education department has a clear plan to do so. And we appreciate those efforts. I look forward to continuing to work with my colleagues to help all students access the life-changing benefits that come with high college degrees. Thank you again to our witnesses. And I just want to make this statement. Critical race theory is not taught in any K through 12 school in this nation. Critical race theory is a specialized curriculum that is taught in law schools and in, uh, in uh, specified colleges and universities that uh, want to offer it as an elective. Critical race theory is not taught, not written, or is appropriate, not offered in any K-12 school in the United States of America. This is a talking point that is being used by the Republican Party to divide races in our nation, divide people, and they need to stop. It is very dangerous, and we need to stop doing this now. We're not on in Congress to divide the country. We have to work together as a nation not divide black against white and come up with all kinds of ideas to do that. And it is, Mr. Chair, I'll yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, appreciate your thoughts. Um, thank you, Undersecretary Kowal and Deputy, Sec Deputy Secretary Martin for briefing the subcommittees this morning, this afternoon, to ensure states, school districts, and institutions of higher education are all using the Education Stabilization Fund, including included in President Biden's American Rescue Plan as Congress intended. The Education Stabilization Fund is the largest single federal investment in K through 12 schools in our nation's history. And in the midst of the pandemic, congressional Democrats and the president included the funding in the CARES Act, the CRRSA, and the American Rescue Plan because we knew states and districts needed to help, needed this help to reopen schools safely, and because we wanted students back in the classroom. The committee plans to continue checking in with the Department of Education to make sure these historic investments in our schools and our children remain on track. And I am confident that under Secretary Cardona and the leadership of your witnesses today, of our witnesses today, the Education Stabilization Fund will not only help schools and students recover from the pandemic, but will also affirm the importance of investing in public education. Again, to our witnesses, thank you very much for the insight you provided to us and also for your patience in today's hearing. I uh, thank you again. And uh, it, and if there's no further business, 
Without objection, the committee stands adjourned. Have a good night, so good afternoon.